All right. What up, guys? How is everybody doing? What up, Daniel? What up, Fish in the Southeast? What up, Frank, Bruce, Tom, John? How are you guys doing today? Active in the chat. We got uh, Tyler here from Hook Sets Are Free. What's up, guys? We're going to talk about some uh, post-spawn stuff, uh, spawn as well, uh, baits that we like to use, and also talk about maybe some small swim baits as well, and um, pretty much just get into that. What up, Tim? All right. Um, well, yeah, you start first, pretty much. I, then I'll lead off of you. Well, in what regard? I, I can um, take this conversation in 12 different directions. You, you're really running the show. You tell me what you want to uh, um, start with. Let's uh, talk about pretty much uh, your top three baits that we use in the post-spawn time. Post-spawn. So that that's a little tricky that's ahead of me by about oh two to four weeks on the average well then do uh then do spawn then pretty Most much of my fish are are still moving up or sitting up shallow not necessarily even locked onto bed so uh, that's going to be really my main focus over the next couple yeah. of weeks um so you know so far the ned rig and the drop shot have been dominating for me a jig has been doing quite well but um i i will be throwing slow moving presentations for the next few weeks or upwards of the next month um things that uh you know depending on the the water clarity and the the weather conditions either something that is super realistic and will fool fish um uh, and also give me an opportunity to hook them as best as possible. So where I can get away with it, an exposed hook um, is going to be ideal. Um, and something that might mimic a little bit more realistic of an imitation. So uh, usually a smaller profile, something in the way of a worm or a lizard or a creature style uh, soft plastic is what I'm throwing the vast majority of the time. Uh, but I will also throw uh, bluegill imitators a lot during the spawn. So uh, that's going to be a huge focus of mine. But if the water is a little bit off colored or say the wind has picked up, like I talked about in uh, the stream that you and I did on my channel a few nights ago, in those situations, I'm going to go to something that's either a bright white or chartreuse or even pink so that my odds of being able to see that bait um, and the fish interact with that bait go up dramatically. I don't think that realism is all that important during the spawn, uh, but it can make the difference in some situations. So that's going to be a huge thing for me. But, you know, in a month from now, when it's full blown post spawn pretty much everywhere, then I'll start switching to slightly more erratic presentations i'll be throwing like a uh a fluke soft plastic jerk bait probably a lot um the the weeds have been growing up uh quite a bit for me i'll also be throwing swim baits and um and jerk baits to a certain extent so uh something that is going to allow for fish to to feel like they've got an opportunity at a big meal and something that is already potentially in danger or uh, trying to get away. So that mm -hmm. is generally my uh, frame of mind when it comes to the post spawn, uh, as well as just trying to get on a top water bite as much as possible. For me, I know a lot of people would uh, potentially disagree with this, but for me here in Colorado, our water doesn't warm that quickly. So it's usually not until about the post spawn that top water really starts getting going. And mm -hmm. um, that's about the earliest that I feel like I can really start having productive days on top water. So at that point, I'll start throwing, you know, a buzz bait, a walking bait, uh, a toad, probably a fair amount, a whopper plopper, something where I can still cover a fair amount of water in relatively high percentage areas uh, before then the fish slow down and go to their resident areas where then um, 
you know, I feel like I can catch them on slower moving baits and I'll start throwing poppers and wake baits and things like that a little bit more frequently. So, yeah, uh, that's my general uh, frame of mind. I'll also be throwing a swim jig and a chatter bait a lot like I tend to do, but I, I throw those in a lot of the same areas or uh, times in kind of that that early post spawn. Yeah. Um, but I actually just throw them year round. So I don't necessarily think of them as true post spawn baits necessarily. Yeah. Yeah. I've been having uh, issues here this year. I don't know what the hell happened, but um, like in my local spot that I've been posting pretty much on my Instagram a lot of where I've been pretty much going fishing a lot. Last yeah. year it used to be like fully like choked out with grass. Yeah. And now this year, for some reason, it's completely like gone and huh. It's pretty weird. And like I said, I was actually talking to Fish in the Southeast about this and um, on Instagram. And I was wondering, like, how the grass could just disappear like that. And I'm talking about I'm massive patches of grass that right. were like 100, 200 feet of long of grass is just gone. And I mean, is it managed by your DNR? I, um, I really don't know because this spot is really like a channel that breaks off of the Delaware. So it's not really like a lake or anything like that or a big lake or anything and um and i really never seen the i had i did hear about somebody saying that they got a ticket from the fishing commission that was there some like a couple weeks ago and i that was really weird to hear about because i was like damn i've never even heard of them right. coming back here so it was really odd so i was wondering maybe that could have any possibility that that's why they were there around there but right. I really don't know, but I've never really had or heard them ever killing the grass there for that reason, because like I said, it was so choked out and it's been like that for years. And right. the only other guesses I'm thinking is that this cold, cold weather that lasted so long just killed it over the over the winter. Sure. But I'm not really sure why that did that, but then that's why I'm thinking that the fishing hasn't been the same since it was last year. And this year, the 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 type of consistency that I've been getting there with catching fish has been different. And, um, and last year it was crazy and it was like full decked out full of grass last year. So I'm thinking maybe that could be the reasons that they probably those fish that were migrated in that area moved to a different spot that may have grass or may have not have grass. So I'm not sure. Yeah. But, well, that's tough to, you know, have to adapt and kind of, refigure it out when you know over the years we tend to fish memories we you know, especially those of us who, who fish from the bank a little bit more frequently you know you you take advantage of what you learn over time um yeah you know where those super high percentage areas are and what they tend to be like so you know when i'm planning to go to a particular spot i take all of that in mind about the, the structure and the bottom composition and you know what lures tend to make the most sense so when that happens yeah it it throws you for a loop at least for yeah. a time or three uh, to really like figure out where the bass might be relating and how you can most effectively pick apart those areas because uh that that can change everything right yeah. there i've had just one body of water do that this year where uh, it, it almost exactly like you mentioned uh, it got out of control over the last three years to the point where it was almost unfishable. It's a tiny, yeah, that's how it was, almost. Yeah. Like last year, pond, it's only a couple acres big yeah. um, and you couldn't throw anything, but a top water and it really had to be a weedless top water. And so it got to the point where, it was next to impossible to catch the fish. And um, I went just to stop by and check it out. Uh, also just to have a, a picnic with my four-year-old and my one-year-old like a month ago. And there was this dude fishing there just ripping bluegills out of there. So I had a chat with him and he said that they had just stocked it and treated the water to kill off the grass uh, or at least mm. control the weed growth. And, um, that got me thinking quite a bit. So I not only saw a lot of bass, not a lot of big bass, but uh, I'm starting to think that this place might be more fishable this year and for the next couple of seasons. But 
it's kind of back to square one in trying to decide one, whether it's worth my while to go there and two, yeah. what I should even do there. Yeah. And that's how it was here. Like you said, it was like pretty much choked up and it, it would like start in the pretty much springtime. It would be maybe about six, seven inches. And then yeah. it would just start getting longer, longer. And then sooner or later it gets to about like, sometimes about two feet long in some spots and like when the tide would go down you just see it's like a like a mat of green grass and literally then when it would go back up it would pretty much come to about from that top of the surface so you could only fish like shallow cranks and stuff like that or even not even that and like you said pretty much top waters are weight baits and yeah. then in the current areas, that's where like the grass wouldn't grow. And that's where I was throwing pretty much my cranks in and right. swimming them in there. And man, they would get, I'm talking about fish after fish. And this year it is not like that. Like literally I'm having to at least, you know, fish or crank my crankbaits for like 20, 30 minutes or change colors or maybe try a totally different bait than what I'm used to, like confidence wise. And right. then ends up catching them. So it's like really sporadic and sort of like you get lucky and um so but the one other spot that i go to that they sort of like dams which kind of sucks and uh, that spot is sort of the same thing it kind of changed the whole pattern that was there because those fish were dependent on that current that was coming through that um it's like a cavern and they were pretty much waiting for that pretty much water to come in and or culvert not cavern and uh they would end up going and waiting for those small minnows, mud minnows, and also the shag would come through there or baby bunker mm -hmm. and would come through there. And the bass would literally wait by the edge because there was like literally a break of current there. And you would just see them coming back and forth. You see with gold flash of the bass come inside. And it would you could literally have like four or five different fish in that one spot. Now this year, there's none of those. You'll see like maybe one or two hanging there maybe thinking right. that they're those fish are going to come there you know because some fish they are like that it's like when they have the some bass getting to that tune of like the trout pattern with the trout stock lakes where they'll start to position themselves in the areas they can ambush those trout right and it's the same thing with these fish and i'm thinking that those are the only some of the ones that were from last year are those same ones that are still there but sooner or later those will vanish when they realize that there's no food there to eat like that and um but there is mud minnows that do come there that i think got trapped over the years and didn't allow them to like leave so um pretty much they're there and that's pretty much their food source for there and i'm not sure if there's anything else there besides like bluegill and snakeheads that's another maybe yeah, another sure. which they'll have but i think that whole spot is going to change on its own and it's pretty much become like a pond and but it's attached to the delaware it's a very weird thing it's that's kind of cool though it's a, yeah it's a pretty interesting type of like ecosystem you could say there but like i said I've, I've mainly changed my uh pretty much ways of fishing there to like now using certain types of baits and usually like last year i was catching them on the evoke around this time and this year the evoke actually hasn't been working as well for me so it's kind of weird and I've been catching them more on that Z1 crank, which is pretty interesting. Well, don't don't you do that to me now, dude. After you well, finally convinced me to throw the evoke. Hey, you know, like I said, up, up. I'm pumped to use it this year. So it changes, you know what I mean? It, it oh, sometimes it's, it's sometimes it might be like the hottest bait for me, and sometimes it may be like the worst bait for you, and sometimes you know it totally. may be the other way around, you know? Absolutely. You might you might catch a shit ton on them, so you know. Yep. No, no, I'm I'm joking, man. But uh, I I saw that uh, Tim wants us to revisit post bond. One to to have you guess his uh, most prime post bond bait, and uh, and then I think you should tell us what your favorite post bond baits are. Really? Yeah, and uh, and also he uh, asked me about what time is the spawn over here, Tim, and um, pretty much I I went and uh this time right now is pretty much i think is the spawn for me because that's why i'm thinking the fish have been really really kind of stubborn um because last week i was catching them pretty good and then this week all of a sudden and the water is around 
65, 66 in certain spots, and especially in the places where I'm fishing at, because it's kind of shallow. So it's like max four feet, five feet in some spots, maybe where there's, uh, you know, a channel at and where the current's at. But in the spots that I've been mainly fishing, catching the fish that I've been posting, uh, the water depth's around four to five feet. And the bass have, I, the bass I have been catching have had red bellies and tails. So uh, I think that's a little bit of a sign that obviously there's some are either making beds or they're starting to actually spawn. And um, that's, I think right now is pretty much that time. So I think within the next week or so, if I do start catching more fish or see more around consistently, um, because I've noticed that they haven't been in the uh, edges of the bank recently, I've noticed more smaller fish around the bank, um, not big ones, which is weird. And um, th I think they're pretty much spawning or in places where they're going to spawn and the fish here like to spawn in places where like it seems like people can't get to or where people aren't obviously fishing a lot I, i'm not sure if they can detect that or know that you know if they know that people are coming there fishing and they want to stay out of that stress maybe i'm thinking that's what they're doing or caught on to that you know uh pattern of people coming there and trying to catch them because you know this spot does get a little bit of pressure but it's consistently, I think, people catching the same fish because you do see the fish with hole marks or previously, you know, being hooked. Sure. Um, I think that does have somewhat to do with it. But, um, yeah. And uh, what was the other one you said? Take a guess at Tim's favorite post-spawn right. bait. Right. Right. Uh, Don't read down. <laughs> Uh, I'll give you three guesses of what prime post bomb is. Uh, hmm. I really don't know. Tim loves a crankbait. What do you, uh, do you have any guesses at? Which one? Uh, I'll hmm. A DT6? I have no damn clue. Or an Evo. Tim, you got us stumped. Drop in the comments. What uh, what crankbait are you throwing with the most confidence in the post spawn, Tim? But um, yeah, and then uh, we'll uh, I'll give you uh pretty much my sort of take. It's pretty much similar to yours, but I uh, I'm pretty much in the po uh, world spawn really or getting into the spawn because some you know it, it, i don't think obviously all fish spawn at the same time so you may catch fish that are going into that or also in the spawn at the same time but um mainly i like to use pretty much mainly cranks and stuff like that but i do use a lot of my swim jigs and um i'm really a, obviously the fan of the mozzarella I always talk about it and um i really like that bait over a lot and also uh a company with the you know power wiggler because when you obviously use it on that specific swim jig the way it falls it falls straight down so as it's falling down you get that tail wiggle at the bottom as it's coming down so it's kind of like when you're say if you are the fish are spawning you kind of get that sort of like the fish is trying to like come into their bed sort of look and when you i leave that usually when i think the fish are spawning the uh i usually let that bait sit there for about four to five seconds and then usually i'll start ripping that out uh after that one time and then i'll just like crank a little bit quick and that kind of just gives it like a reaction sort of bite and sometimes as soon as i after that wait for that five four seconds at the on wherever i cast or think there may be a bed because usually you can't see it too much from the over here it's pretty much like guessing and unless you're obviously on the bank directly and fishing right in front of you but i'll pretty much just cast where i'm gonna go and like i said wait about four or five seconds on that swim jig and then just rip it and then just continue reeling and usually as soon as i rip it and then start to reel you'll feel the bite and yeah. then just let go and just set the hook but that usually works pretty good and that's what i caught those two fish on Instagram the other day um, that I posted was on the Mataraba. Um, they did not want the crankbaits, which was weird. I've tried like literally all my confidence cranks 
and literally not one of them got bit. And so, and I tried them in pretty much everywhere I could literally throw them. And um, also I even tried some swim baits as well. I, I didn't get anything on that. And, um, but I also like using pretty much, um, what's it called? Uh, how did I just forget the damn thing? I don't like using really soft plastics too much. For when I'm going to spawn. Ah, this little guy. I had this little guy right here. Oh, nice. It's a little optimum, uh, pretty much like a little swim. You could pretty much say it's like a swim jig. But this little guy here, you can use this in current pretty much anywhere, really. And it does really well. And you, I have a couple of these. This is just one I've gotten recently, actually. But it's a little optimum 3.5. Uh, I forget the actual name of it, but it doesn't really say it on the package. It just says pretty much the 3.5 optimum. But it's a pretty good little bait, and it has a good little, it doesn't have crazy tail, but when you pretty much wind it at a decent speed, if you're going especially past beds or anywhere near those beds wise, you can catch some decent fish with them. And, um, and again, near current, they're pretty good, and they have a good little uh, tail kick to them. Yeah, I find that the optimums are uh relatively stiff at their smaller sizes you know yeah. they still have fantastic action right i mean i talk about this bait all the time yeah uh, and it, it's just a slimmer slightly bigger brother to that bait right the baby boom boom um and they they make this in you know a line through and um you know a handful of other like harness style baits but this guy is is meant to be fished weedless and it's four and a half inches the the bigger brother to it the standard boom boom is six inches and the papa which is down here is eight inches and has a lot more tail on it but yeah same deal as what you just mentioned like yeah that thing is not bending over on its own right yeah no not so, really you know you really have to have this thing it's in my opinion some people would disagree with you know some of my comments on the mag draft but i really do think there's a sweet spot speed with these baits uh especially the ones that tend to be a hand poured and uh and have less tail on them i think it really needs to be at like a true medium speed because they are susceptible to potentially blowing out if you burn them but if you really creep them they're not going to look like much you know yeah and also you know another baits really i like to use are hard baits for swim baits wise but like i said recently i really don't want to say that uh you know there's the best thing to use or you know the, my top thing because really i haven't had the best luck on them so from recently i will say that i haven't had the best luck on uh small swim baits but like i said before i have had good luck with them around this time and around the spawn and post spawn time usually with the tiny clash and smaller glides and you know these the 135 at that i slide 135 yeah the yeah. 135b and you know and then this bait has worked too really well and uh has got a lot of use for me and a lot of uh fish last year for me and but this year like i said i have not caught as many and they've been acting a lot weirder i've had a decent amount of um follows and stuff like that but no bites and usually i end up having to follow up with like a crankbait and that's actually how i ended up cat not catching but i hooked that big fish that i had that i got the hook in my neck with was i was using actually the k9 before that and i was using it in the current i was just cranking and cranking it and literally after i stopped doing it, i was like all right i'm not getting any bites and i kind of kept feeling it hitting the bottom and it was sketching me out i kept thinking it was going to grab wood or something yeah and i was like nah i'm not doing that and so i literally ended up just taking it out and then ended up throwing that z1 
And all of a sudden, I see this massive ass fish coming, and I'm like, "What the hell?" I was like, "Where did that thing come from?" And I've never seen one that big yeah. follow my bait there like that. So I was like, "Where?" I was like, "There's no way that big fish was gonna go after this tiny little crank." Right. And, and yeah. It, I mean, that's a that's a wild thing to think about, right? Yeah. You go from a you know a six inch bait, which you just referred to as a smaller glide bait. Yeah. to then you know a a two inch crankbait um it, it's wild to think about yeah the fact that a a giant bass might see this and say nah and then see this and think here yeah. we go let's go get that yeah you know, it, that kind of goes against a lot of conventional beliefs in that big bass like big baits and bass are opportunistic feeders and in the post bond when looking to recover and feed back up, then yeah. they go after the biggest meal possible since they're relatively low on energy. Uh, it's weird that they would yeah. just smash a tiny little bait. Yeah, that's true. And that's what I was saying. You know, I was confused. I was like, wait, well, I was like, why the hell did that thing just come up to this, but then didn't come up to the K9? And I was really confused. And like I said, I ended up, she just ended up grabbing out of nowhere. And I was like, what the hell? And that's when. Like I said, I set that hook and the damn thing ended up flying out of his mouth. So, but well, it almost makes you wonder like, is it sounded like you were saying the water's not quite warm enough for this, but is it possible that the shad are spawning in that area? And um, it, I did see a few shad that were about like literally this size, and I've have been, I've been forgetting to bring it with me, literally like this size exactly. Oh, Jesus. Okay. So, They've been around there, and I don't, I don't know why I haven't been bringing this with me, but they literally been – I have seen at least, like, a couple of them, but I haven't been seeing the small ones that I usually see. Right. Them. We're not talking like, oh, yeah, you just whip out the little stuff, and they're just going to – No. Okay. No, no. I haven't been seeing any tiny ones. Uh, uh, like, literally, the only ones – only small things that I – a small bait fish that I have seen there are the mud minnows, and they stay there u usually, like, year-round. And right. they're by the thousands. I mean, literally like thousands of them on the bottom. And sometimes when the tide goes down, you literally, you can see the water like moving. It looks like literally, it just like little tiny ripples. Totally. And yeah. so yeah, that's I've what seen, I think they feed on a lot. I've seen giant balls of bait a couple of times. And you, know, you see from this picture that like those shad are like the same size as a, a lipless crankbait, right? I yeah. Mean, I, I, yeah those I have not seen. I intentionally went to to grab these to get a, a color pattern and a size because they were in balls of the thousands. So I could see that they were small. So I started throwing something to try and replicate that. And I knew there was a decent chance I would snag one or two of them, but uh, didn't expect both trebles to get one at the, the exact same time. But some other dude was live bait fishing at that place, and I was like, here you go. He was throwing night crawlers, and I'm like, this is probably going to do you better. Yeah, that's true. And, and that's why I really was surprised that I wasn't seeing a lot of those smaller, uh, like, shad or any type of shad, really, that was smaller. But, like I said, that fish was big enough to where it could probably eat that uh, this size of a shad, no problem. But then when I saw it going after that small crankbait, I was like, why the hell wouldn't it'd be going after that and was really surprised by it. So, well, like, yeah, it's, it is confusing, but you know, it, it reminds me of something that I wanted to say to respond to, uh, uh, Daniel's comment a minute ago, he said, at what temperatures do they start staying more deep or how long after the spawn? And, um, you know, while it would be nice if that was an exact, science where there was an equation to it and yeah. theoretically you know it's, it's around. maybe a month after the spawn um maybe less maybe more but the reality is there are a lot of fish that are residents of shallow water and um so it's it's not a be all end all type of thing so um you can catch fish in the shallows all year round and um i'm sure matt can attest to that that 
uh, there are a lot of fish that just hang out on the breaks just right at the drop off so you can run your 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 bait in the shallows kind of right on that line you know on the edge of a grass line or on the edge of a drop off where the rocks drop off from two to five feet or whatever and there's fish that will just hang out in those holes where they feel protected and it's a good ambush spot no matter so they're not always going to seek deeper water um, in the summer in fact a lot of fish do not so uh, while it would be nice to just assume um, that all fish go deep at whatever time of year or at whatever temperature that um, is not necessarily the case now of course yeah. the the giant bass probably have more uh, habits and more say in you know the best spots and will go deeper because that's where they know that they have the best protection and um, are going to have more meals and uh, be able to to kind of dominate a larger area. So yeah. I can't quite answer that. Maybe it's 70, 75 degrees all through the summer until it starts to cool back off and they'll start moving shallow again. But um, yeah, a resident shallow fish should not be overlooked. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's definitely like all over. Like I said, it, not all fish are spawning at the exact same time. You know, some spawn earlier, some spawn later. And, you know, that, in you know, coincides with how long they're going to end up becoming into that post-spawn time. So right. it's really all around ranges. But, you know, there are some that obviously spawn within a, a group or a mass of fish that will spawn at the same time or around the same time. So they may be all within that same range within each other. So, but you will have those, you know, outliers that are there that, you know, some will be there and, you know, catch, you can still catch some pretty big fish sometimes in that, you know, spawn to post spawn time. And then you have those females that sometimes they don't even find a partner uh, and, you know, actually spawn and they end up absorbing their eggs. So, you know, and that, those are the females that usually stay pretty big all year round and will get massive in the summer if they do that too. Um, and sometimes you can catch some big fish, you know, those type of fish. Sometimes they're not a lot of them, but there is some of them. And, How do you um, identify that? Um, um, if you catch I, a fish in, you know, the, the post spawn or in the middle of the summer, how would you be able to tell if, if you think you could, uh, that a, a, a female has absorbed her eggs? Uh, usually, in my opinion, I think it's more or less that you pretty much will look at their their bulk or their size. Um, if you see that they're pretty full out still or filled up to where they look like they are still in like a post spawn sort of stage, that I would say that that probably fish has not probably uh, mated or spawned and probably is gonna probably absorb absorb her eggs or either find a partner later on during that year because there is fish that have spawned later on during the year, you know, midsummer or maybe when that water starts to cool back down and into that winter time. Cause there, you know, there has been people who said they've seen fish going and spawning in the fall time or close to that fall time. Not sure if it's actually been proven true, but I'm sure there, you know, is fish out there that have done that you know because nature is yeah you're not completely you know one way or just you know an exact science sometimes so i think that sometimes that's how you could tell but usually it's not i don't think there's any really other way to specifically tell unless you know you the you can maybe see if she by obviously touching the fish and seeing if there's anything coming out of the fish as well at right. that time to see if maybe they're still spawning and if not maybe that can kind of tell you that maybe that fish hadn't let go of her eggs and actually just absorbed them so I, i'm not really sure yeah but. g Fon says what what's your favorite retrieve to crank this time of year um well, right now, recently, what I've been doing, uh, it didn't work for me the other day, but the last week I was pretty much uh, speed cranking on rocks. Um, I was pretty much deflecting off rocks. I would allow the crank to just kind of grind on the rocks, not too hard, 
but enough to where it once it hits another rock, it would cause the bait to go to the right or left and then come back to center. And uh, that's the one thing I was liking about that Z1 was that it was working on the rocks pretty well, and uh, which was surprising for how small the lip was. And um, mm -hmm. and it has ran into some wood as well, and it did pretty well, you know, uh, which was another thing that was surprising. And um, and I'm not sure if that's just due to the angle of the bill or the angle of the bait as it's running through the water, but um, it, it did pretty well. And the hooks really aren't that big on that bait neither. So I think that also has to do with it. So but, on what the Z1? Yeah, the hooks are pretty small. Um, I think they're like a six or seven. Yeah. Maybe. And uh, makes sense. Yeah, I mean, for me, this time of year, I'm, I'm mostly throwing, you know, anywhere from a flat side or a, a balsa, a DT four or six to then a more like a square bill about now. Uh, so usually more like a true medium speed retrieve where I'm, I'm looking to make contact as much as possible, but depending on how familiar I am with that body of water, um, I might fish a little bit slower if I know that there's wood nearby or a lot of uh, bigger jagged rock where I've historically been hung up more. Uh, so I'll, I'll pause a little bit more frequently as I'm bumping. I'll probably only contact two or three rocks in a row, cranking it along the rocks before I let it back out a little bit and then bump, 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 and then stop. But usually I'm, I'm looking to, to move it pretty quickly. Um, I'm, I'm not burning crankbaits this time of year uh, necessarily, but I would say truly a, a medium, maybe medium fast speed retrieve. Uh, I don't, I don't really ever want fish getting a super good look at a crankbait. And um, my water is pretty clear at most places that I fish, uh, at least right now it is. So uh, that's the other thing is, you know, I'm, if I'm slow rolling a crankbait, it, it's usually putting off a lot more vibration. And, um, so that's where I much prefer a swim jig or a swim bait over a crankbait or a spinner bait, or even a chatter bait quite this early in the season for me. But as we get further into the summer, then I'm, uh, it, you know, game on when it comes to retrieve speed yeah yeah same you know uh like i said i pretty much stick with like because that's what really works for me in the delaware specifically i'm talking about the delaware mainly because that's why i'm fishing but in tidal rivers specifically but um when i'm fishing lakes i tend to use more like square bills or grass square bills or square bills that work in grass better than some and that evoke does work pretty good for being a square lip in grass. You wouldn't think it would, but um, since it vibrates so hard and really has a pretty hard thumping action, it almost like clears itself from the grass in a way and um, kind of just mows through it in a way. But if you get too deep, it will grab, but it does really well. And since it's very buoyant, it does pretty well in some shallow water, especially if you use some higher pound line. Um, especially with like, since I use 17 pound with it most of the time, uh, I'm pretty much getting around like a foot and a half to two feet at max. If you kind of put the rod down and burn it. Damn dude, you're, you're using 17 pound line with the Z1. Uh, yeah. How do you find castability? It's pretty good. I mean, I, I can launch it since it has the LBO. Okay. Yeah. So. It's yeah. pretty, I use a 17 to 16 pound for most of my cranks and mainly is because I'm, like I said, I'm mainly near rocks. And once I'm grinding those baits down, the line kind of gets worn on over time. Oh, for sure. And so I, it's like the 17 pound does well in it. And it kind of gives me some time to at least use that line for a little while before having to cut it and just put a, you know, tie a new knot on. So yeah. But it does still over time will get bad and I still have to cut it. But I like to use that just in case. And if say also if I get in a little snag, maybe get a chance to maybe bend that hook out and get the bait back. But, 
you right. know. But that's yeah, a, no, that's interesting. I I just felt the need to ask because for most cranking, especially small body cranks, yeah, I mean I'm throwing twelve pound most of the time. I rarely go smaller in diameter than that, but um, I only occasionally will step up to a fifteen pound line. It, it's usually when I'm uh, on like a a medium body crank, or if I want to run it shallow. Yeah. Um, otherwise I'll control the depth with my rod and sometimes the speed of my retrieve, but you're absolutely right about abrasion of line. You know, I'm retying probably a couple times per outing. Uh, if I'm like primarily cranking, yeah. I, I notice every few casts that I'm, I'm grinding on the rocks. I check my line and I'm like, Hmm, that is going to break. Either I'm going to break off my bait if it gets hung. Yeah. Or I'm going to break the bait off if I catch a fish. So yeah, I end up having to retie somewhat frequently. And I even have that happening with, you know, my 17 pound, you know, sometimes I had that happen. I lost a damn um, a crank bait that I got in from an Epic Eric box to another one. And I I've literally yeah. got the damn name and it was another really hard bait to get. I think it was a Craig Powers bait, a crank bait. And it, it really was pissed me off because I had caught the fish and it was a decent fish too. And literally the, I had grabbed it. And then all of a sudden the dams, it slipped out of my hand and the line just went and snapped. And I was like, Oh shit. But then I thought the fish would be fine. It started flopping like crazy <laughs> and literally got in between a crevice of like some rocks and like went down and like slid like a little water slide back into the water with a 30, 20-something, 30-something crank on its mouth and just glowing. And I was like, oh, my God. And he's just swimming away. And I was like, oh. That's brutal. And I was like, and I, I started, like, hurrying up to try to uh, get, like, my another crank on. I was like, dude, I got to see if I can catch this fish again. But they right. were biting good that day. And uh, literally, it just – and that was the same day I ended up getting hooked as well with the damn uh, crank bit on my neck. So, Well, maybe you'll get as fortunate as you have – with with some other baits and you'll catch that same fish and it'll still have that crank in its mouth dude that'd be nuts but so we've, we've missed a bunch of comments i maybe. don't know if you care or what but deep ass thank you and love what up illuminating and any look on the Beast Coast Miyaga I never have. I use them in California swim jig trailers. I've been buying new flipping jigs to have a warehouse by accident. Notice the Beast, hook, Beast Coast little Magnum has a BKK hook. Nah, I haven't actually used any Beast Coast jigs. I think Tyler has, but I haven't personally. Yeah, and I just picked up another pack of them like in one of my most recent orders. They started making some HD colors in this bait. Um, you know, Beast Coast has made a handful of different soft plastic swimmers, and um, they used to make a finesse swim bait called the, the Chaos X, and uh, that was just like a little three and a half inch swim bait, it was good, but for some reason got discontinued. Um, they also made a bigger bait, they still do, that I don't like, it's called the the creep um which in my opinion is not great for creeping the tail looks better right now as i'm holding it up for you guys <laughs> but as you'll be able to see the tail really is only the last like 10 to 20 percent of the bait and um these things are not durable at all uh, do not hold up well, because of the way that they're poured, but yeah, the Miyagi's on the other hand, I've had quite a bit more success on. I find that they're quite a bit softer and there's something about the profile of this guy. It's four and a half inches in length, but it's, it's got a deep belly and it's wide open and yeah. perfectly designed around a six odd owner beast. And, uh, the only one that I have rigged up on an owner beast is actually up in the garage, but I actually also like them on a swim jig. Mm. 
So this isn't a, a true swim jig. This is just one of the uh, Six Sense Divine swim bait heads uh, that I've tied pretty good. a skirt onto. And um, so that way I've got like a, a custom swim jig. And uh, this is a big profile swim jig. I've made it so that the skirt is is it's cut all weird, but I, I kind of liked it the way nah, it acts good. in the water. And so, sure, you get a lot of tail on this thing, but it folds up super easily um, and has a pretty aggressive kick. So I've had a lot of success on the Miyagi, and I like it quite a lot. Um, and honestly, I don't think that the color pattern – matters all that much although i'm a sucker and so i saw some of the new colors and you know this is a herring color but yeah. for me it looks more color. like a gizzard shad and so decided to pick those up because i think i only really had that sexy shad and like a rainbow trout pattern but on each of these i've, I've caught probably anywhere from five to eight fish Per bait. Um, there's that Chaos X tiny little, like three and a half oh, inch. That reminds me of the, I think what it's called, tapioca color. I'm like scared to throw that because it's discontinued. And, you know, I went through a couple packs of them like a handful of years ago and I yeah. gave them away and then they just disappeared off the market. But the Miyagi's a good bait. Hmm. Yeah, I never tried them, but they definitely look good. Like you said, the profile looks good on them. Yeah. And on that swim jig, that definitely looked pretty good. So. Mm. Don't crank. Yeah. I, I really don't have a choice at the moment, but I do have a kayak. I just have not really got it to really run it i gotta get all the stuff for it but i've been slacking on that but I, like i said i've been so used to fishing from the bank and that's mainly why i use the heavy line it's really just to keep the baits from going sh to go shallower since the like i said what i'm fishing can range from four to five feet to sometimes two to three feet and sometimes shallower so it matters and like i said that's why I, and but and i really like cranks you know it's something i've done since i was like young and uh, actually that's what i was like my first like baits i was using when i was young was crank baits because i really didn't understand all the other stuff the soft plastics and stuff like that i really didn't know how to use it that well and then when i started actually snakehead fishing and got into that that's when i started using a lot of lizards and cinco's and all this other stuff because they seem to like that a lot and um and that's when i got into that so really crankbaits has been something i've used for a really long time and that's why i really got used to that and I noticed i really i haven't noticed any of a difference besides the fact that like i said the line breaks easier and uh that's really sure good. but let, let's talk about casting angle though right i mean that that's the main difference when fishing crankbaits from the bank versus from a boat casting at the bank yeah. Um, you know, for anyone who's uh, more experienced, you know that it, it's not going to usually do you much good in fully fan casting and casting straight out from the bank. You know, you, you ought to be paralleling um, most of the time. And so it's a totally different mindset than, say, if you're on a boat and you find a spot where it drops off uh, or you're fishing to the bank and bringing it back where you know that slope is something you can take advantage of and you've yeah. got an entire cast working for you. Whereas if you're on the bank and you bomb a medium or deep diving crankbait out there, by the time that you get it down to depth where you're actually reaching fish and have a decent chance at catching them, yeah. You, you've got very little time before then you're working uphill. So it, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. So 
I, I get what you're saying. Um, you know, I, I forget who it was. Tom, you know, so really it's in your best interest to fish shallow to medium diving crankbaits and turn and fish at a slight angle or parallel yeah. with the bank so that you're riding that edge where it's dropping off or you're fishing dirt shallow regardless yeah. you know you don't really want to be fishing deep to shallow you want to be running at mostly the same depth the entire cast so that you can take advantage of making a long bomb cast and staying in the strike zone as long as possible really yeah and that's really you know the tough part you know of certain places you know when you're bank fishing you know you may not have that ability to you know get to that cast or maybe the way that the water is positioned the water is structured in that area may not be that deep or like you said it may come up in a, a higher elevation from hot you know deep to low so you may not be able to do that but like i said if you have and you know you know certain cranks and the what they do and the depth they run and if you know your body of water you know that i think that's really the best way to uh get you know the best um you know outcome of pretty much catching the most fish you can is by really reading the water that you're at or figure out what the water or is how it's structured and the depth ranges and stuff like that and really figuring out how to get that bait to where it's running where you want it to go so and right. that like i said that's really the main reason i use that heavy pound you know 17 pound line is because it really gets the bait to where i really need it to be to where instead of it's digging in the moss or the dirt or the mud and then getting all the slime all over it, that's annoying. And that's why most of the people when I'm bank fishing, they ask me, what are you using? And I'm saying a crankbait or jerk bait or a bait that has treble hooks. And they're like, oh, well, don't you get snagged? And oh, don't you get moss all over your stuff? And I'm like, not really, because you know I'm fishing the baits that are meant to be in that depth range. Yeah. And they're also, you know, or I'm using that type of line to where it's getting it into that depth range where it's staying that two to three feet and not getting to the bottom where all that dead grass or wherever it is, that moss stuff For is sure. grabbing onto. So, and I think that's really key. And even with, you know, swim jigs that I use and stuff like that, that happens with, it's just like this thin slime grass and dead also grass that they have there that um, gets all over this, your pretty much baits. And you have to literally take it off every time you bring your bait back in and your hands end up stinking like for, <laughs> days like after it's really weird it's very pungent yeah it almost stains your hand right so it, it, it's really a some people don't like that and that's why they really will tr a lot of time you see a lot of people using top water and i'm like confused i'm like dude you're, you're not going to catch anything with that especially like sometimes i've seen guys literally fishing top water like a couple months ago when it was still cold right a guy was using a whopper plopper and i was like what are you doing bro and i was like yeah. i guess maybe he wanted to catch with me a snakehead because i think that's what he was trying to catch but sure. they weren't even thinking of that because you know snakeheads they start to go nuts out of nowhere and recently i've been seeing tons of snakes that's one thing i've seen a lot recently it's just it. tons of snakeheads just breathing on top of the water interesting and like, jesus and literally I've, I've actually seen more this year than last year and all combined so, do you ever intentionally target them i know there's some dudes like uh sometimes and sometimes no it's because they can be a pain in the ass oh yeah no i mean you don't you don't want to break off some of your high dollar baits you don't want to you know get your hand tore up you, you know it it's more just annoying than anything right it's like intentionally targeting pike are you going to use your bass gear to try and catch those fish yeah. it's probably just not a great idea yeah um you could but you know like i know at least on instagram uh jimmy from rar fishing another one of the brand ambassadors at discount tackle yeah he's like he's super into bfs fishing for largemouth and he's super into snakehead fishing and he he fishes frogs for snakehead like frequently yeah that's um, what most guys do yeah i i just don't know like really like it's that or a buzz bait really uh sure. it's like a real 
big things that you want to use or swim baits like i said i've caught a few on swim baits on the you know i've caught uh we're really i've caught both fin and snake heads but they're literally on both of these two baits here actually on the 135 and the tiny clash is both yeah. been on uh you know uh what's it called with snake heads and this one actually that's why the real hook, hook doesn't have the fur anymore is because uh it bent the whole hook out from the snake head and it was actually i think would be one of my biggest snake heads but it came off the tail was massive i've never seen a tail on a snake head that big and it was pulling drag out of my lose 300 and right. so it was nuts it almost felt like a striper and i was actually pretty surprised and i was like oh sh like I, was, I really didn't think they was going to pull that hard but and well, I, I understand that's that's a big reason why people target them yeah right? it's just for the the fun of the fight and yeah, the blow -up, also right? you know another thing is too is that i think you really it's you i you shouldn't really use treble hooks with them uh, too much because they are kind of sketchy and if you don't have you know i i would definitely obviously have a lip gripper if you're gonna fish for them because and pliers you want to put your hand anywhere near them and like i said they as soon as you grab them or literally put the grippers on they want to twist or barrel roll all over and yeah. i've seen some guys get hooked really bad from snakeheads and stripers too that's why a lot of guys that striper fish here they just take the treble hooks off and they put the j hooks on or straight inline hooks and then they just crush the barb so that once they if they do get hooked in the hand or anything they can just pull it right back out sure and so right. it definitely right. helps you know it's almost like a trout fishing lure in a way right and all you just got to do for that is just make sure you just gun them in you cannot take your time or let them play with it or they'll just jingle the hooks out right so you really got to with the straight j hooks and or the inline hooks you got to end when you also crush the barb you just gotta literally just force them in you cannot let them at all get any slack because they'll come right off well the comments are flying adam my hair up mahara jp harold what's up dudes what up and also snake is they definitely do have extremely hard hard heads man it's nuts you can knock on their head like you hit it and it's like what yeah that's creepy it's it's sick and it, and then also like their mouth on the bottom it's very weird it's almost like their skull is literally out it's like very hard to explain but like their lip what they got an underbite it's like nah it's it's weird it's like their lip is like attached to like cart of like literally there's just cartless there's like bone because i remember when i had the lip grippers on one time and it started thrashing the lips started moving a little bit and it kind of like tore and literally you could see like white bone and i was Weird. like holy hell and i was like damn and it was just literally bone and then the teeth and i was like damn i was like there's like no skin and it was kind of <laughs> it was like weird and it was literally just literally white almost like bone on the teeth and then literally just hard cartilage and i was like damn no wonder their mouths are or their head and everything is so hard so it was pretty interesting hmm. and they're not it's a little different than like both and they're similar obviously in the structure of face wise but they definitely have a different mouth and they definitely rip your bass gear up like your jigs if you use it for snake heads man literally after one or two fish it's done they will literally destroy your wire guard yeah that sucks they literally just mash it up and bend it and literally mess right. it up And I've had also snakeheads like rip the hangers out of my damn crimpates. Hmm. Yeah, I had a lipless, uh, chrome lipless crank, and I, it was just a regular old rattle trap, and literally just you know reeling it in. And it's that's what I've seen. I've actually noticed a lot more is that chrome, gold, uh, pink, uh, all vibrant uh, mustard, yeah, like a mustard color. Um, all those colors get like snake heads for some reason and I don't, I don't know why but i guess it's maybe just a flash but they love that those colors for some reason i've noticed that 
And literally, like I said, when I was literally cranking that lipless in, it just got hit. And all of a sudden, literally the fish took off, but then it just started barrel rolling. And you can feel it when it's starting to do that in under the water, like the rod will start literally doing these weird, like long bows. Like you can, it almost looks like you're fighting a damn striper. And literally the, the rod would just keep going up and down. And that's them just trying to like roll back and forth up and down. Right. Literally as it was doing that, the damn hook, the hanger of the hook, the hook hanger literally just got ripped off and bent out of the plastic. And literally I was like, what the hell just happened? And I'm looking at the bait and I'm like, where the hell is the other hook? And it literally saw it and it literally had a hole in it. And I was like, holy shit. And I was surprised. I was like, wow. So, like I said, there's definitely some big ones up here. And yeah. I try to kill them as much as possible, but. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, I know it's uh, known to be an invasive species, uh, just generally speaking. But some places are more outspoken in saying that it's the type of fish that you are not to release. Right? If you catch a snakehead, you murder that bastard. Uh versus some places it just being seen as kind of like whatever you yeah. know if if you want to keep it or kill it yeah that's your choice but um you know i know a fair amount of people actually do release them and i i kind of wonder about that especially if it's in a body of water where they're kind of messing up uh, the forage for a lot of the other predator species it's especially like that you might be trying to catch largemouth bass and you just happen to know that the more snakeheads that are in that body of water, the worse it is for the bass. And, uh, yeah, I feel mixed about that too, though. Like I follow a couple of people on Instagram like that, um, aquatic biologist, right? I think yeah. it is handle. Um, what's his real name? I should know it. I don't. Uh, Might be Ben. No, it'll it'll either come to me or I'm sure that Adam will mention it in a second. But that dude is like, now he's specialized in knowing small bodies of water like ponds. Yeah, yeah. That are maybe like ten acres or less, so it's a little bit different of a ball game. But he claims that crappie. Green sunfish, uh, maybe even catfish, like, are all horrible for growing big bass. Yeah. And it's like you should just have bluegill. Bluegill and bass, and you're good to go. And yeah. you should have tons of bluegill. And it, it's kind of a wild school of thought. Uh, you know, I, I never thought about that kind of stuff until I started watching – what he's got and now i'm starting to wonder like damn in some of these smaller places where i fish and i know that there are some big bass but not a lot most of the fish seem like they've got stunted growth should i be just taking all the crappie out of there that i catch like <laughs> that makes me sad you know i'll probably end the crappie population in those places if i do uh because i don't think there's a ton of them there but Theoretically, if they're messing up the bass spawn and if they're eating what the bass would ordinarily eat, then screw those crappie, right? Yeah. I It's hard to like. That's how sort of like that spot where I'm at right now, where, like I said, is damn that. It's pretty much like I said, that's where I, those snakeheads are at. And that's why when I do catch them, I either will take them, kill them or literally just transition them to a different place where I know they're not going to get back into there. So, you right. know, that spot will get at least uh, alleviated from them because sure. like I, said, I do believe they do affect the size of the fish, but I have caught fish around four or five pounds or a little bit bigger near with places that have snakeheads. So it kind of makes me wonder. But then again, I also hear that, you know, snakeheads are more of a, small bait fish feeder or eater and they like to eat small bait fish um you know small uh shad you know shiners um right sometimes also crustaceans as well you know frogs and things like that they don't really eat bigger 
size prey too much unless they're like the giant snakeheads which don't live here that i know of which would be nuts if they did and that would not probably be good <laughs> but you know the uh ones we have they have pretty decent mouths and some that i've caught that weighed you know 10 pounds had literally you know mouths that were like that big they weren't massive and literally a three pound bass had a larger mouth than them so right so it's very interesting to see that and i'm thinking that maybe they could probably eat small baby bass which isn't the worst thing in the world because then they're controlling those small bass population to where the smaller bass aren't annihilating all the small fish so and then also those bigger bass will eat the baby bass as well so it's almost like a trade-off in a way that they're both going to be doing the same thing so i think it's if you as long as you don't have too big of them big, big of ones you're not going to have too much of a problem but if you have a lot of large ones in there where they're eating a lot of food because snakeheads do eat a lot that they will diminish the bait source in there and then also then cause you know a struggle for the bass to then continue that you know size that they are and probably get starved out but like i said that's all in theory yeah no and i know you got to respond to a comment but i i this is something to talk about another time but i do wonder about you know baby bass patterns and just how frequently big bass eat baby bass and how you know in what situations they choose to do that and when and why we ought to throw baby bass patterns you know i, I fell in love with this this is a hand painted by Debo of you know one of the tiny clash uh, knockoffs and I just kind of had to have it yeah and uh, so I I've always wondered about big bass eating little bass but why don't you talk about that Chippewa blade since you yeah. got that comment pulled up and I'm curious to hear your feedback on it I'm not interested in buying it right now because I do have a follow-up question for you. Yeah. Uh, after you tell us that no. it, it's worked wonders for you no 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 I, I actually i've been using it recently and that's the one i had uh got and it's actually on my rod right now but um i i haven't had the best luck with it um okay I, it does have a good swim to it and it, it de definitely looks pretty nice and in, in the water it, the, the blade i think gives it almost like a swim wobble to it um and then you obviously get that extra flash to it but it is pretty nice. It's a nice crankbait, but and the profile is pretty thick. Um, so it definitely has a good presence and definitely gives off a nice color. I have the, uh, I think it's called the Dead Shad or Matte Shad. And literally it's a nice crank, but um, like I said, I have not caught anything on it yet. But like I said, recently I have had a little bit tough time with the crankbait. So may, it may be just something with that for the moment. So I, I'm not going to say it's not a bad crank bait or, or give it off just the rip. So I sure. will be testing it out and see how it does. But I've heard a lot of good things about it and that, you know, it does, it does do well near cover surprisingly or near rocks and stuff that, you know, even though it is a circuit board, you're not really supposed to use them too much on rocks, but, um, you know, it definitely does do pretty good on cover for being a, the bill that it has. It's like a round bill. So, you would think it would get snagged pretty easily, but it seems to do pretty well and it does have a pretty good buoyancy to it. So I think that does have part in to do with it, but also in the angle that it does run may have to do with that as well. But um, I did test also another bait too out that uh, I showed the other day, which was the this bait right here. Uh, the Mola Mola. Uh, oh yeah, shit. Okay, you tried that? Yeah, yeah, I tried it out for a little bit, and it, the head on it, it definitely does hit a, a little bit. I don't think it's going to pick it up, but... Dude, it took me a long time to find that on the hookup, you punk. I forgot what it was called, and I didn't want to go back on my live stream to find that. I was like, you know, considering making a purchase on the hookup, and I'm like, what was that freaking bait? Did you even and make a purchase this weekend? I, I only, I made a small purchase from Tackle Warehouse, was it? um so we'll see are, are all the sales over i figured yeah, they are tonight. what's that it ends tonight 
Okay, so if they're not over just yet, then I probably will make one or two more purchases before. You got about like ten minutes. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll see. I'm not. I'm not in a rush necessarily, but I am an impulse um, a purchaser. So oh. I bought. I pulled the trigger on a smallish order from uh, Tackle Warehouse today. It was only like 75, 80 bucks. So yeah. maybe like ten different things, but. Um, a mix of like a couple of swim baits that I hadn't tried before, um, and some soft plastics, but you guys will see that in a upcoming stream in a week or and a half or so. Tell us about that bait. Yeah. Um, but this, right. Uh, as I was, like I said, when I was, uh, cranking it or explaining on the stream that it literally, it's like it says it does ride very vertical almost literally like straight and as it's like hitting the rocks you can feel it literally just hitting and it does pretty good and like i said it doesn't get stuck as you would think and i've actually tested it near wood to see if it would get stuck just on on purpose not too far off of the bank you know so i could get it and literally i ran it through it and it literally just went boom or let me get like this and then it just kind of just climbed over and it went right over and that hook if you kind of can damn it if you can kind of see as it's going that hook bottom hook really even never touches anything so right and odds are it's it's running yes yeah, so, but i noticed if you do stop and it you know it don't actually continuously reel or worm the the crank it will start to go back like that right kind of a uh, thing you got to be careful with sure and i almost got it snagged into something and definitely noticed and i was like oh shit i was like i can't stop so it's something that you definitely want to consistently keep on moving uh, even if it's a slight amount with the rod like it says to worm uh that definitely helps and, it, and as soon as you little little bit of motion it literally puts it right back into that angle and um it is definitely a pretty cool interesting you know uh concept so i definitely want to see if that ends up helping or when you know the fish are a little bit more pressured and um they see a little bit more cranks when this you know like i said if the crankbait bite starts picking back up i'm definitely going to try this out and see what it does so and what's it's also the, a big bait you know it's not too small i was going to say so what's the weight on that thing uh i'm pretty sure it's uh five eighths and okay. so not that bad but, no. but it's meant to be like you let it fall to the bottom no and you, you grind the bottom or does it automatically oh, like dive I, down that was one thing i noticed that too is that you do not want to let it just fall to the bottom or and go down because as it's falling it will go in a, a like correct itself and end up going like this and then it flutters like that so what i would do it and honestly that could work if you're in a little bit deep water and you know how deep it is and you can right. kind of rip it up and then let it just flutter back down but uh, what I noticed is that as soon as you hit, let it hit the water, you can start cranking and it'll start literally diving on its own back okay. on down. And as soon as it ends up starting to hit stuff, then you start feeling that. And then you can kind of slow down and then start to just use your rod to like pull it against that, whatever it is you're pulling. And I guess as well as it's hitting, it kind of creates that tension and it will then kind of make that bait go up and vertical in a way and just continue to keep moving like that. And it does have a good uh like wobble to it. it, it it's pretty wide it, it but you don't feel it as much it's like almost like the rod is going like slow it doesn't have like sure. a crazy fast wobble to it but okay. it's really very unique and it's color you really can't see it. it's weird but it that little bottom when the sun is out man it literally makes it orange it's pretty interesting hmm. you kind of see it a little bit but hey, just like a dot of it yeah but and then on the bottom like under the chin there's like actually aren't there it's very hard to see but when it's in the sun it literally just this whole bottom right here the whole head is like orange interesting very weird and i didn't even notice that until i went the other when i went the other day and checked it oh yeah there, there you go i can see it yeah so it, it's a pretty cool color and i was mm. like wow but like i said it's a pretty interesting bait and i definitely want to see how that ends up working out Bassless chap, Ron Holly. What up, Ron? What up, Bassless chap? Uh, let's see. What other stuff? 
Well, we've missed we've missed a lot of comments. People are applying, and that, that's not a bad thing, but it's hard to keep up, you know. And uh, Adam, I fish near pretty much in the Delaware. Uh, it's off on a channel, uh, pretty much where I'm fishing at. It's like a back channel that connects to the Delaware. And pretty much it's off. I'm not sure if you're from South Jersey, but it's pretty much called the Tracks. It's a spot that's pretty much located on a train track. And um, you can kind of access it by uh, kayak, but you can also access it by land or walking if you're from the bank. But that's where I pretty much fish from. The rest of the spots that I go to really don't have rock. It's mainly like sand and mud. But this spot specifically has like rocks from the train tracks from them spreading that out. So it's like, I guess maybe the rocks they put there is just to support that there and ends up creating a whole bunch of rocks. So it's kind of like a unique spot, but there's definitely rocks all around on the Delaware. But, um, so I don't see any more questions. Uh, yeah people are kind of all over the place when it comes to what they're talking about all right well um Nails and chatter baits and swim baits and crank baits that are kind of all over the place i know that adam has been posting a lot uh this year on instagram about his homemade crank baits has been selling some of them i'll say that Adam, your skills have uh, definitely improved quite a bit over there. I mean, what? It's been six months. I know you've you've gone from standard painting to uh, using an airbrush, and you're starting to make a higher number of baits. So uh, not only are you getting more familiar with the process, but you're also you're making stuff that runs true and, and looks true good in the water uh, and i think that's as important or more important than having a bait that looks super pretty out of the water uh love seeing when you post those uh swimming videos of your homemade lures because they look good yeah that's pretty cool i really like i said have you um use your uh anime crankbaits as much still not or as much dude i Literally, like, I, I only threw them enough to get to know whether they ran right. Yeah. But I swear every bait that I made was a flat-sided balsa crank. And, um, you know, the unfortunate reality is I had two baits especially that I was interested in getting to – know better this spring uh that are in in that same arena and you know the main one was the og tiny and uh <laughs> this thing is 10 times better than any other stuff that i made uh, and again it's less about looks even though my baits looked very similar to the og tiny in terms of profile yeah. And sometimes uh, the bill size, although I've been putting polycarbonate lips instead of circuit board, which I'm sure makes a big difference in terms of the action. But that and the Spro uh, Little John, the shallow runner, Little John 50, I believe it's called. Both of these baits are flat sided and... Uh, I, I like them a lot better than my my own homemade baits and the, and they're not the only ones that i've been trying to fish and uh so no my homemade baits have gotten very little time on the water because i i'm a bait junkie as it is so that was just something really that was a fun hobby for a, a period of time to familiarize myself with the process of making baits but i came to realize that there's a lot of fine tuning and after the fact tuning that needs to be done 
Um, and it is just a, it's an art, dude. You'd, you'd have to get very efficient and um, then your skills would have to get super good for it to be well worth it. You know, I'd sure. rather just spend the time fishing or making content or doing real work, making money to be able to support the other habits. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was nice and I, I very well might do more of it. I could see myself getting into, you know, making mold and, and pouring, uh, making swim baits or making some custom soft plastic baits or what have you uh, down the road. But is it ever going to be a side project that turns into a money making venture? No, no. So what's the point? You know, I sink money into fishing. I'm not going to make money from, you know, making and selling baits unless it was something that really got in the way of me being able to spend money on fishing and enjoy fishing. Yeah. And um, that's what I like for now. Uh, G Fon says, not sure if you fish Noka Mixon, but I'm heading there this weekend any tips and nah, i have not fished there but um if you probably uh you know let us know what you know type of water that is and you know what it consists of the you know on the bottom and stuff like that maybe we can give you some tips but um but yeah and um what is uh your the top three or the uh, small swim base you brung to uh show off a little bit say that again what are the uh, little uh, small swim baits you brung to a uh, show for pretty much your, you know, top three or whatever you brung? Yeah. Uh, I, you know, I, I brought a fair amount of things, but I, I didn't know exactly whether we're talking about hard baits versus soft baits. Uh, so, you know, if we were just talking about hard baits, just whatever is pretty much like your preference, I, I would say. Pretty much what you feel, you know, most confident in. Well, <laughs> that, that kind of ranges, right? I mean, and depending on the time of the year as well. So, a bait that has really impressed me and come onto my radar that's going to be more and more a bait that I fish is a small swim bait. This is a Savage Gear Pulse Tail uh, Bluegill. Now, they make the Pulse Tail baits in, you know, all sorts of different profiles and sizes, right? So, in the trout, I, I like the 8-inch a lot better than I like the 6-inch just from a, a profile and an action standpoint, you get a, a lot better action at slower speeds out of the eight inch than you do the six. But I wouldn't consider that six inch or the eight inch a uh, small swim bait by any means. But in the bluegill, like the, the big ones are way too big, right? Yeah. Uh, this is a massive That is a big one. And then the medium size one is a, a bit more reasonable, but still a pretty tall profile. Yeah. And then as you step down to the little four inch, I mean, this guy is perfect. It's snack sized. And so now they've made it in the pulse tail, not just the old like 3D, you know, multi jointed bait. And I really really like these guys uh, for their realism for their price tag and uh just generally the the quality that you get in them so savage gear is a a company that on the whole has impressed me a fair amount over the last handful of years with how they've stepped up their game in the freshwater space and so when it comes to hard baits I'm a big fan of the, the Shine Glide from Savage Gear that has kind of stood the test of time for me when it comes to when I'm, I'm rotating and trying different baits and comparing the action of them. 
now can you call the the 185 uh a small swim bait uh, maybe maybe not right like it's a right at about seven wow. inches and like a two two and a half ounce bait so i don't know it, it's more of a, a true medium size bait whereas it's baby brother that i just picked up in the off season this year the 135 uh is one that out of baby brothers <laughs> that i've tried out um uh, it has probably impressed me the most i talked about this recently how the uh The Sneaky Pete's little brother, mm. the Pistol Pete, that did not impress me a lot. I really do like the Sneaky Pete, which is a, a bigger, maybe true medium size, seven, seven and a half inch bait, same as that like 185 from Savage Gear. And um, I love that these G-Rat baits have swiveling hook hangers on them and a really wide glide. Like, look at how steep that joint is compared to say the shine glide yeah, um, yeah. it's a little bit it, more but it it's a it's more dramatic than you would think um uh, it it leads to you being able to do a lot more with the shine glide uh yeah than just a straight swim i feel like the pistol pete is more limited in that way as you start slashing and doing more erratic things with the bait it starts to look real weird on you Stop. and uh, want to go in all different directions and not in a good way so yeah. the the shine glide in the 135 has probably impressed me the most aside from say the the jackal ganterell jr uh you know, it. I like it more than I like the the full size Ganterelle. One because it's it's more castable, but two. I just I think it's more likely to get bit, right? Uh, this is like a, a five inch bait, maybe an ounce and a half, and um, the full size Ganterelle is kind of a a big bait. Uh, being a bluegill profile, it just it feels kind of tall i'm sure it would get eaten really well i just haven't given it the time of day this is a a newer bait for me too the, the full-size ganterelle yeah and um, i'm still getting fully familiar with how i like to fish the ganterelle and junior uh, because it's a floating bait and so it's meant to be fished in a lot more shallow of water and um acts different but that shine glide 135 and the gantrell jr are right there another one that's new to me that i've tried and do like the action of that is a multi-jointed swim bait is the six cents trace um again this is one you're just going to want to work more on a straight retrieve not do a lot of funky stuff with it but it has a very natural swim to it that i think will work really well on a faster retrieve so i uh, got a action video that i recorded on that but what's crazy about this thing is the tail um i think this is going to be a real big problem okay i fished this thing twice and uh didn't catch anything on it and this tail is already starting to tear it comes with two in the package but uh, these tails are super, super soft and kind of stretchy, and uh, I see that being a real big problem, especially if you get short strikes. This tail is just going to get destroyed, and I don't know exactly what to replace it with to be able to have it give the right action. So, they don't sell replacement tails? What's that? They don't sell replacement tails? Uh, they probably do, and... Uh, you know, I wonder if I could put something comparable, you know, another shorter tail, like from a, a glide bait that would fit in the same yeah, spot. Yeah. It almost looks like a, a universal slot size. Yeah, it looks like the like a clash joint. 
tail. Right? Like a lot of these have that same shape. You could probably get away with the K9 tail on there, the straight tail. That's a good point. And maybe I should try that at some point. But uh, yeah, this Six Sense Trace is one that intrigues me and that I do plan to fish in Gizzard Chad Waters uh, a fair amount this upcoming year. But. I'll, I'll leave you at that because, like, I can keep talking. Uh, yeah. the BBZ one, six inch from Spro, underrated, and one that I throw frequently. One bluegill bait that um I do like actually a lot. It's pretty decent. And uh, if you do get to, like, rigging it pretty good um, or take your time, really, and I think that's what you should do is really take your time and kind of uh if you're gonna go and fish have them rigged up in a way to where it's almost like pre-rigged but the uh amakatsu javelin gill yeah someone was asking about that on our stream the other night and uh that's one that i've been curious about because what it's it's somewhat similar in design and rigging to you know the gill flat and the gilly right Similar, yeah, and you could say it's pretty much like the way you probably rig the ghillie up to where it would end up, you know, uprighting itself. Yeah, uh, and that's pretty much in this same way. And the, the good thing about this one is that it comes with a wire that's built into the nose. So in the nose, there's actually a coil uh, wire that's actually pre-put in there. So what you do is you'll take that hook, guide it through that, obviously, that um, little wire, and then you just uh, take it back out and then just rig it back up into another spot that's pretty much pre kind of like there it's almost like a spot where you would have it uh oh. hidden in like the fin it's so higher up on the bait you're not just rigging straight in the side huh no 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 it's like on the bottom right here on the weird bottom, right there it's like in an angle almost like yeah a hook here there we go whoa so, so if you look at the hook it's almost like in an angle yeah and then uh, I also take a, it, the right there is a little weight that goes in. Yeah. And it's just, a, I think it's like a, not, I think it's like a one gram, not even, or like a two sure. gram little weight. It's not even much. And so is it for stabilization or for Yeah, what? it's pretty much just to help the bait as you start to reel, it'll start to upright on itself. And also there's a foam on the head, inside the head. So Did you put there, that in there or am I? Like, no, is no. this all the same as what you mentioned with the gill flat? Or were you talking about this bait the other day? No, no, this is the different. The gill flat is very similar, but this one comes with a different type of foam. And uh, They both come with springs and foam, right? Yeah, well, the uh, I see, uh, I say gill set has a harness that's sort of like built into the head of it. And the... Uh, What's it called? And then it comes with that little foam strip, but it's very similar in the way, like you could say, if you take these two and put them up to each other. Yeah. You know, they have the same thing. It's just that obviously it has that, you know, uh, sort of like minced meat sort of look. <laughs> right. And then you have, you know, like the that top obviously hole that's on the, the head where there's this little tiny foam. Actually, I can show you from the other ones I haven't had glued in. That you're supposed to glue that foam in or not it will come out if you get a bite on it and sure. there's actually a couple things you have to do with that bait before actually uh using it and then like i said this one has that little harness it's like a u little clip that's in there so that when this is being pulled it can't be actually pulled out of the head really so, so it, it's like a hole that's already uh poured into the bait right yeah it, it's it like reminds me of that duo you know, I bought, I don't know if I'm going to use this bait, but the dual realis. Uh, there you go. Like it shows you the wire right there. This tiny little gill, right? The Nomase gill is meant to be nose hooked. Has that, that hole in the nose as well. Yeah. They make these weighted and not weighted, but you can see. Yeah, I got a couple of those. Actually, still has them in the packages. Right in front of the eye. I don't know if I'll be able to get that angle. You can see that hole. And it's meant to be, you know, just like wacky rigged right through the nose. Meant to be fished on 
a drop shot, I think. No, you yeah. can. Uh, you're supposed to uh, put that uh, the nomad skill on the uh, on like a sort of like a drop shot hook, but it's supposed to be a lipless sort of bait. Oh, right, right, right. Without having to have vibration or sound, so it's almost like a silent lipless soft bait, pretty much. You swim it. Yeah. I still might drop shot it. You could. You probably could. I wouldn't. I mean, if you you can probably nose rig it. I'm sure it probably would work. But like I said, this is the um the little foam part. This is one that hasn't been obviously glued in yet. But if I just take this and like squeeze it, you'll see it come out. Oh yeah. But this is not foam. That's actually regular foam. This is weighted foam. So this is actually weight. So this oh, is not. Interesting. So, so this that's is not, how you weight it. It so doesn't. Yeah, this is not to make it actually sink. I mean, uh, float is to make it sink. So when you huh. take the foam out, it actually will start floating. And so, but then if you keep put this back in there and you're supposed to degrease it before you uh, use it, and then you put it back in, and then uh, after you do that, then you can put a nail weight and you can then make it pretty much become a little bit faster to where it'll sink a little bit easier on you. And it also helps it upright a little bit easier, so. Now, could you and would you use that type of foam in the gill flat? Where um, it sounds like the foam that you use in the gill flat is for the opposite effect. Yeah, it's the opposite. So pretty much the, uh, the gill set has foam that floats. So really, it's already weighted, pre-weighted. And then uh, since you want to make it have a little bit less of a sink rate, you can put that foam in and cause it to either float or just slowly, slowly sink really, really slow. Or you can obviously add and add a little bit of a nail weight and make it sink faster. So it's like it has a multiple different uh, scenarios where you can have different sink rates or whatever. Well, so the density of the the soft plastic that those baits are made from is is different straight out of the pack. Yeah, the one that uh, these here, these definitely are, are probably a floating type of plastic, and the you see is definitely a sinking probably type of plastic i would say because it definitely doesn't float it right. sinks and um and maybe do that's due to the weight as well that's on the chin because sure. it does come with that little chin attachment thing that's on there yeah. but these overall they're definitely pretty unique and like i said it has a tons of instructions on the back and you definitely can understand it but if you just take and use your google translate you can figure it out pretty easily and it pretty much tells you that, like I said, that you want to make sure that you rig that uh, hook through that little screw that's through the nose. You want to uh, you know, degrease that little foam uh, insert or not. It will slip out. And I've saw people on Tackle Warehouse come crying about that saying, that, you know, that it, oh, I caught one fish and the foam flew out. And literally, and the person asked them, like, you know, did you glue it in? And, you know, that and someone commented that you have to make sure you glue it in or not. It will mess up. And I literally did that and it didn't come out. So and I just use mend it. Literally, you just take some mend it and after you dry it off, put it back in and then it seals it over and it won't come out. So it's pretty interesting. But like I said, it definitely works. And I, I think it's a probably a, a pretty good bait for spawning so maybe you could try the gilly as well or you could substitute for that as well if you just rig it the same way so but they're a pretty good bait and surprisingly they're pretty weedless like the hook that's on the side like i'm running my finger along and it's not catching at all so that's not uh, you don't have it tech exposed huh do you have it tech exposed or no 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 it, the hook is right there let me see if I can get a angle of it. <laughs> Look at your face. Yeah. It's, yeah so that's just wild. Yeah. It, it's a totally different angle of rigging than I would. Yeah. It, it's, and then also, yeah, I put these little tiny, they're called like Harmony Bait Keepers. And uh, they're like little tiny rubber grommets on the bottom yeah yeah on the on the hook itself so that yeah and that kind of helps because this bait is very oily and um it, it wants to slide on the hook a little bit if you was mm -hmm. to just hold it like this and so when I, once i put those on there it kind of helped that 
issue and but right. not enough to where it keeps the hook from actually sliding all the way back down and yeah really good and i think that really helps you know it'll still slide down like see it's you know slides yeah. down pretty easily and then you can just put it back up and it doesn't really want to tear the plastic as much neither so nice helps who yeah. makes those that you're using those those little pegs uh, that that's literally their, their name is called Harmony. Harmony, okay. Yeah, yeah, they're called Harmony uh, Bait Keepers. Got it. You can get them on Amazon. They're like three bucks for like a hundred. So they're pretty cool. Yeah, and, it seems like a practical solution to use on a lot of different uh, yeah, that, riggings, whether you're Texas rigging or you use them for uh, your jigs, and they help save yeah. your uh, keep your baits a lot. Pretty good yeah so it definitely work and then uh also a couple there's another uh small baits that i like to that recently actually i've, I've discovered these guys and I'm surprised i haven't seen them sooner and the bigger size is actually really nice and i actually want to try and get it but the only person that has them is carolina tackle and they're charging like a ridiculous amount of money for them which makes no sense but and when they're really actually pretty cheap and um on you know uh the hookup but these here they're a nice little joint bait they're called the uh biovex joint bait and it's literally just a minnow style bait it's a multi-joint obviously it's a slow float but it's really a floating bait and uh, i put these little uh the little zapu boards it says to put two uh one gram uh on each side of the body to where it will make it into like a slow sink and it does very very slow sink i mean like probably a foot every like seven eight seconds oh geez and so it's pretty slow and that i think that's why it's pretty good in the shallow water you can really kind of let it sink there for a second and then just work it yeah. but it's pretty nice action for a small bait and it makes a good amount of noise on top of the water especially if you kind of go a little fast it has a very good sound to it and um and like i said i've caught a few fish on it already uh not big ones they were all small little dinks but yeah. you know like I said, it, it was pretty surprising that, it, you know, it caught the fish pretty quickly on it. But it's a good little bait. And like I said, I was surprised by the action and how versatile it was. And it worked pretty well for being the price that I paid for them. They're not expensive from the hookup, like 14 bucks. Okay. So they're pretty reasonable. And they have good colors, you know. But like I said, they, they really are nice. And I was surprised by them. And they work really well. So I think that they're going to do pretty good sooner or later when this, like I said, when uh, the water or the fish change into that post spawn time and they're hunting down the shad, I think those are going to be really good because this one here pretty much looks like the little mud minnows yeah. that we got here with that little purple on them and that green sort of top. And then this one is just, uh, I think it's a bluegill color, but then it has that like wounded sort of red color on the bottom. Yeah, I like that. Which I'm a sucker for colors like that, even if it's not a, a real bluegill profile. You know, I'm, I, yeah, I just bought something else like that. Um, that's more of a a trout slash minnow profile in a bluegill color. So, yeah, yep. Yeah. And then freaking um, there's another one that I like a lot too. And it's not too big of a bait. It's like a seven-inch glide, but it's a uh, 86 bait uh, Doom Rider, and it, yeah. it's a good bait. It's actually, I think it's one of the best small profile glides you can get. Um, the prices go uh, are crazy, really. To be honest, I don't think it's really worth buying. To be honest, in my opinion, yeah, it glides amazing, and it really is a nice bait. But the prices are kind of crazy and especially recently that i've noticed that his price has gone up a little bit uh, before it was you know a little bit expensive now it's a little bit crazy so and they're like i said they're not a big bait but the glide on them are crazy and like i said yeah, it looks fantastic it looks really realistic but yeah uh, and, when you say crazy what what are you talking price wise well, what does he sell them this one when i got it i paid 180 dollars for this okay and, yeah that's crazy his newer baits or the newer ones i've been seeing they're ranging i think now for like 
another, I think they're 190 now, and then the the gill bait he makes is $230. Right. So, and the gill bait is not even that much bigger. It's a little bit bigger than this one, and it doesn't have as good of a swim as this one. So I was wondering where that price kind of variation came from, if the bait really isn't that much bigger and is the same sort of thing pretty much, and it doesn't glide as good. So I was kind of wondering, you know, where that comes from. Well, but, it's probably a mixture of things, right? I mean, if if that dude is uh, gaining popularity and um, yeah. can charge more, he's probably going to do it. And then on top of that, it it's probably time-consuming to make something that's different than what you've done before. If it's a different yeah. profile, uh, if, if it takes more time to tune it and to figure it out, uh, if it weighs more, it takes a different material. Maybe that all kind of works into the equation. I don't know, but yeah, it, it is. I mean, good on you for recognizing that it's a bait that doesn't look as good in the water and cost more. So why would you do that? Whereas yeah, know, guys, the writer, you know, what there, there was a couple guy, a, a decent amount of guys who said that as well. And then a guy that does uh swim bait reviews he actually is that's what his name is on uh youtube and he literally i asked that same question i was like why did the price jump up and but then the swim is not as good as the you know doom rider and pretty much he had the same question he was like yeah i was wondering that as well but he pretty much stated that it wasn't much bigger so it wasn't the resin cost uh the bait is pretty much the same sort of joint style so that really is not that big of a difference. It's just the, really the profile overall. And if you have a 3D printer, it's really not that crazy. But, you know, right. it's pretty easy to do if you have a 3D printer mold-wise. If you're doing it that way, it's not like a master mold where you're carving it, at, you know, by hand with wood. Those are a little different. And, um, but overall, like I said, the paint jobs as well is just the printer paint job it's not actually hand painted uh, so that's why this paint job it looks like it's pretty much brand new but this was literally snagged on the bottom of a damn river for like a week and sure. also got retrieved and literally the guy was hitting it the hell with it with the damn retriever right and it doesn't even have a scratch on it. like that's wild so it and i can literally if i take this damn hook I'll go like this with the hook actually to show you. If I take this hook and I'll grind it into the paint job back and forth, look. That and hurts me to watch. Like nothing's there. It's weird. So why, dude? Is he using some sort of special it's, seal uh, up in there? Or is it the it's from Swimbait Underground? That's the collab that he does with them. That's why it always says 86 baits. And then like swim bait underground collab mm -hmm. that's what he's doing he's sending these moles to uh swim bait underground and they're pretty much going and using this uh transfer printing sort of technique it's pretty much like a special lamination printing and it's pretty much how i think six cents does their crankbaits as well and uh it's pretty much the same sort of way but it pretty much makes the lamination and so it's like almost like that uh the berkeley real 3d stuff finish yeah it's pretty much that same thing but with hard baits and so they get a more realistic look on the bait and plus more durable of a paint job because it's almost like printed into the damn bait right and it, it almost feels like there's no clear coat really it's very weird like it almost feels like matte and almost has like a texture right yeah it, now that i'm looking at one of these i I agree. This has a more of like a matte finish. Yeah. And so it, it's very weird, but it definitely lasts a lot longer than most paint jobs. Huh. And I'm not sure it's, it's because maybe it's just printed into the thing. And Now I'm going to go scratching these up, dude. What are you doing to me? So, yeah, like I said, and I, I don't know. like, And I like literally scratched that hard as hell. No, the Berkeley's scratched the Berkeley. These, these will scratch, dude. Look at that. That's that's two medium, medium <laughs> scratches. That's, 
that's just two times uh like medium strength scratching all right this this will come off for yeah. sure that's crazy yeah i really don't know how the hell it does that but like i said it, it definitely does and then you got this guy here that'll throw it like two times and you got that much rash on it right so but that's really just something that's known with you know tiny the drt and stuff like that is certain colors they have better paint adhesion adhesion and some don't and, and it's mainly the chrome colors that actually have that issue um but even with the other colors they kind of will chip away pretty quickly and that's why a lot of guys that are recently uh, get the drts they kind of just get those hook rash covers and um right and those definitely work they definitely help a lot like you could use your bait for months and it won't get any damage to it nor will the film that's on it will just sort of get like a, a sort of like a blur to it almost and Wouldn't that affect the look of the bait though dude no no, no. I'll, I'll show you actually i have a whole bunch that are like that and you can't even tell like this one here is it gotten about the same use as that actually this other one that i have is the same damn color and uh this one here actually has it on there and you kind of see the the rash starting to get on the thing on there but there's no rash on the actual bait hmm. and it's still good and like i said this bait has gotten used pretty good it's got some chunks on the top and stuff where it's gotten hit and then like i said the actual hooks will hit the actual bait and it still makes like these little tiny abrasion or sort of like small like sort of like sandpaper like uh right. texture and you can even see them in the joint like it's sure worn so it's out. just totally clear or what yeah it's totally clear there's no um like matte sort of look to it it's completely clear and you can barely even see it yeah and uh it does have a little bit of a weight to it but it's not much it's barely anything and like i said it stays on there really good and like i said these are two of the, almost the same around time because i have bought two at, at the same time and literally they're almost not even close to the same right so and as ap's asking then why why wouldn't you use those what is there a disadvantage to using those you know rash covers um not that i've noticed not really i mean sometimes i have had my hook where if it kind of gets like in a weird angle it can kind of like it's pinned into it a little like, it catch it. Gets, like stuck but not really much like it doesn't happen much and it, it like i said it almost a little bit in a way too quiets the hook points hitting the body Mm -hmm. um, in a way so that, i think that kind of helps but also keeps the hook points from getting so dull from hitting the side because right. with the bait i've noticed that this bait literally the hooks will hit the body so much so hard that they be, end up becoming like dull like these here they're kind of like dull so they're not really the sharpest so like probably that. need to sharpen or replace those one one hook point still good yeah <laughs> gotcha but like I said, and, and these are actually known for that. These hooks here, they're known for getting like that. And it's because of the way they're like actually shaped. And it's because they smack back and forth really hard. And, um, but besides from that, like I said, they're the rash guards work pretty, pretty good. And I don't see really no difference. And like I said, some guys, they, they like it. And some guys don't like the hook rash, but I think it helps to have, you know, since you're paying, you know, the money you're paying for the bait, I want the paint job to last as long as I can. And, right. You know, I think that does look better. But, you know, some guys like the look of that too, you know. So it really matters on what you want. Right. Yeah. Some guys prefer the look of hook rash just for, I guess it's more of like a reputation thing, right? Where um, the way that it looks to other people yeah like, oh you use your baits oh you catch fish with it whether or not that's actually true right true. uh maybe you've maybe you've cast it a, a bunch uh, yeah. and, and you've never caught a fish on it that and the hooks have done all that damage that could be possible but um like 
freaking what's it called i actually have uh on that one actually where the hell did i just put that thing it just like disappeared oh and literally the this one here this had got like the both and destroyed it right there it's yeah. like hard to where the hell it's right there man i'm trying to get to zoom in but you can literally see like the teeth marks from the like getting into from the, the bottom pot. right behind that hook rash yeah point. yeah it's kind of hard to get it almost looks like it's chunked out a little bit there we oh go. there dang son yeah and that man that was that was that six and a half pound both and i thought it was a massive bass man and uh it literally grabbed that and i was it literally t-boned it and i was like holy shit i thought it was going to be a massive one but ended up just being a both and the both and actually had like a um hook in his throat i felt real bad for him and it was a real pretty it was like bluish teal almost color it was pretty cool I answer JP's question real quick while I, I take a quick leak because I think that's a good question and I'm going to turn up the volume so I can hear it in the background. I've asked you before, but it, it's not all fresh in my mind. Just low float versus high float. It says, uh, you, you have a present from DRG Tank Clash low versus the high. Actually, I don't have any of the high floating, actually. Um, I only use the low floats and I have a bunch of the low floats. And uh, mainly I see the high floating one mainly as like a top water bait or a very, very shallow water bait. And uh, really that's what I see that as, or like I said, a burning top water bait. That's how I see it because that's really how I've seen them used. And they do, I'm pretty sure the high float has like a rattle or it's a little bit louder. And um, the low float is more of like a pretty much crankbait sort of slash glide matter on how you weight it out or suspend it and uh you can pretty much get the bait to suspend if you actually weight it right and um but like i said i like to use the tiny clash pretty much as like a dead twitch glide uh, and pretty much just twitch it near a structure and things like that or i'll use it in current and literally rip it in current and then just stop it out of nowhere when it hits something or rocks and then cause it to just float up real slowly or it'll stay suspended if i have it weighted towards that but that's pretty much what i'm using them for and the different scenarios but mainly in that low you have like 10 different scenarios you can do or 10 different ways you can use it and if you really have all the different lips and especially the k9 does a ton of different things but the tiny class specifically is pretty versatile as well and uh, now that they have the new lip out with the uh, YMTK, I think that's what it's called, and uh, the new tails, the verse, uh, what is it called? Uh, I think it's the Versatail, but it's literally this, I'm pretty sure it's like it's this one, but in a different uh, shape. It's like a rounded out tail. I have it on this one here. And it allows you to burn the bait a little bit more smooth, smoothly. And this one is pretty much is a different shape tail. It's just rounded out on the edges and a little bit more steeper. So it gives it a little bit more, allows you to burn the bait more with less wobble. And so that's what's pretty cool about that. And then the Y and TK lip is like, it's sort of like a wake lip and it causes the bait to roll really a lot. And so you get sort of like a, you can go very, very slow with it and crawl it and have that sort of just like almost like in a spy bait sort of way, you can pretty much do that or like an eye bait. And um, so that's pretty, pretty cool about that. So like I said, there's tons of different ways you can use them and really whatever you think you want to use it for, you can do that. And literally sometimes you can substitute the tiny clash for some other baits, like a top water bait or a walking bait you can use that tiny clash in that same way because it does have that capability of pretty much dead twitching, which is like a walk and pretty much subsurface as well. If you mattering on pretty much the way you have it rigged because the shallow lip, uh, which is a little different than the deep lip that it comes with or the standard lip that it comes with is it runs up very shallow and pretty much is like a foot to two feet max 
uh, matter on the line size, but it'll pretty much stay about a foot under the surface and you can just pretty much twitch this back and forth if you have that straight tail on there, not the V tail. You can do it with the V tail, but it doesn't look as good in my opinion. I think it gives you a better, more realistic profile with that side uh, v, you know, v tail on it and allows you to actually get like that fish profile instead of having that dolphin sort of tail on it. Do you orient the, the tail up more frequently? Uh, mm, hold, uh, actually, uh, hold on. See you, Adam. And um, the, uh, with the tail mainly, it matters on the way, I, uh, the way you obviously I'm going to be using it. But if I'm going to be cranking it with the lip in, I usually use the tail up. And then if I'm going to put the glide in, I'll have the tail down. So the tail will be like this pretty much. Tail down or mode B, I'm pretty sure it is, with the lip out. And then. Yeah. And so, and then if I'm going to have the lip in, I'll have that reversed the other way. And then you can also crank it with the tail down. And what that'll do is just get the bait deeper. Right. And that's how it really does. And I actually have it that way rigged. That's what I was doing when I was had this lip when I was cranking in, in uh, near the rocks. And, uh, like I said, if you want to do that, you can. And like, there's really no right or wrong way of using it, really. And it's just really on how much you like whatever it's doing. So you pretty much have to test it out and, you know, try those different ways of using it. And, and whatever you like the most, I think that's what you should go with and try first. You know, if whatever you think that the fish may be biting or how they may respond. Or if you're looking for a reaction bait, that dead twitching sort of... Uh, uh, technique is pretty good because it's almost like a jerk bait mixed with like a walking bait. Sure. So it, it's pretty much like that. And I think that's why I was catching a lot of fish I caught last year on them. But like I said, this year, for some reason, I haven't had the best luck with the tiny clash and that's kind of been weird. So, and I've used also the K9 as well. And I haven't had any luck on those as well, but like I said, it, it's sometimes on and off. So, But good luck on the water tomorrow, Nathan. Yep. See you, Nathan. And then um, this is one that I actually uh, recently uh, got that I have actually uh, haven't been able to test yet. But the reason I got it was because the different the reason why the guy made it, which is Bass Brains, is that's the name of the company. It's called Bass Brains. Uh, company and literally it's the uh, gladiator glide and uh, it, it's a pretty nice little bait and the, what the reason is what he did with it was that the joint on it is very similar to actually the bull shad glide yeah which yeah, it's got a lot of distance in there huh and so the bull shad glide has that flat sort of actual uh look in it so what that does is it gives the glide a little bit more versatility instead of actually having the joint where it's a V joint right limited a little bit more and what this would do is actually allow the glide to go very wide on uh, these you can kind of get almost uh, a different uh, array of things if you work it a different way and you could work this a little bit faster and get those fast glides yeah. or you can work it slow and it'll go out wide and you know still get that nice action to that or you can swim it and it'll actually, which I don't like to do too much, is where you cr straight crank a glide bait and it'll swim literally erratic all over. And then you just pause it and then it'll just like go one way real far. And then you just keep doing that. But that's different ways. Some guys do that. Some guys don't. You really have to have the right glide to do it or not. It'll just kind of almost like want to roll on itself and look like a damn flounder swimming sideways. <laughs> and so, but sometimes if you have the right one or where the tolerance of the glide or the joint is very small. And that's what I've noticed on most of my glides that actually have a very consistent straight swim to them is that the joint has barely any movement or no movement at all. Like that one is not moving up and down at all. Sure. And so what I've noticed that when the joint doesn't have that little bit of movement or play, the glide tends to stay more horizontal and even on the glide. And so, but then when you have actually some slot in that uh, 
play or a little bit of play where the, the joint wants to go up and down or a little bit like, uh, where is the one that I have that actually does that a little bit? Or, yeah, here we go, a little cheaper on the glide. Or actually, this one actually doesn't move either. But, uh, oh, here we go, this one does. This one here. So this one here it has a, mm -hmm. lot, a lot more play in it. And so with this glide, when you're noticing the ones that have that little bit more slop in that uh, position, the glide will actually want to go up like this, like it'll roll up. Interesting. Want to come and roll down and then come back down. And what that is, huh. is because since you're pulling on that glide and that say that that back joint is still not aligned and say when you put this in the water, the joint will start to float with itself. But since that there's that little bit of play in there, when you right. pull on the front, the joint wants to go up. See if I'm kind of like showing that if you. Yeah, that, that looks like a lot of play. And so when you actually pull on that damn camera and when you pull up, it's going to want to pull the bait up and then start to glide. So every time you're going to do it, it's going to want to climb up. So that's what I've noticed with that. But then when these that have very little play, they just will stay straight and almost just continuously glide straight. And not want to rise up or go down or bow in a way so that's what i've noticed and like i said that gives you a little bit more difference uh you know versatility of having the bait where it obviously has a little bit more you know stiffer of a joint to where it will actually glide more consistently straight instead of having such wide actually glide so and that's how the bull shad does too. You know, it, it doesn't have a lot of play up and down, but then it has a good joint on the middle where it has plenty of movement. And this is one glide you can literally straight retrieve, no problem. And it will actually swim straight. So it's pretty interesting. And like I said, even though it has that, you know, flat joint in it. So, and, and this is a pretty good bait too. But I'm, that, yeah. that's something I noticed. Yeah, I never thought about that before. That made me look immediately at the uh, <laughs> the river to sea S waiver, but I, I think it has more to do with the the angle of the joint. I've always thought that that bait swims a little bit janky, um, but I've noticed it do that in in wanting to to rise up on the glide yeah um, and and you know not be super smooth like i've i've fished the the slide swimmer 175 a, a handful of times now you know that that was new to me in the off season um i mean my god but it's, uh, it's the smoothest thing in the world yeah and it's wide as hell yeah, and the, you're right. Like the joint, actually, you know, like I said, it had the actual degree of the actual joint itself definitely has to play with on how you know wide it actually will get. Yeah. And, but the like I said, the top play where it moves up and down, mm -hmm. definitely I think where it causes that bait to want to go up. And I have a couple baits that do that that have you know play in them that you know the the joint moves. But right. And if you if I go like this it's definitely a lot look at that. that's a ton of play so and that's why this bait when i literally will do it it'll go like this and want to come up like that yeah and it arches it's like that but if you go slow and you take your time like on a slow glide it'll definitely glide out very very wide on and hmm. so it like you said it's definitely the mix of both but I, I've noticed that on the ones that were tighter or more confined in the actual eyelets themselves, there's no room. Like, see, there's absolutely like no room for that that inner uh, eyelet to pretty much go up and down and play. So it's very limited, and I think that has a lot to do with it. But and that's that other guy, that Esqua that I was telling you about. Yeah that pink one with that orange belly Roman made a Yumi or a Yumu or what, what what's it called? yeah I'm pretty sure the Yuma 
Mm -hmm. But this guy right here is a pretty good little bait, and it definitely has a, a, a unique S swim. It's not as uh, straight as this guy. Like this one will definitely swim pretty straight on the retrieve. This one has like a wider S sort of snaky swim to it. And uh, it kind of looks more like a fish, sort of like wandering around versus it just straight swimming. And yeah. so, and I think that's what gives it a little bit of uniqueness. And um, and they also are now making like a wood version. They're now making a sinking version. So this one was the floating version. So that's why if you look at it, I have the weight on it. Sure. That, that weight. And then I also have the whole back weighted, like the whole thing on the back is all weights. Got it. And so it's just golf tee and it matches with the back. That's why you can yep. see it. So, and, um, but like I said, it, it's a sick color and I've caught a couple fish on this, uh, decently and they're pretty good. And the hooks are pretty strong for being as small as they are. That one got bent. If you can see it actually. Yeah. And, uh, but that was on like an in current. So whenever there it's in current, the fish fight pretty hard, but it's gotten some decent bites and like i said it nothing crazy but it, it, it swims pretty good and sometimes you can find them on ebay for like 50 60 bucks and that's how much i got this one for it was brand new and it was like 50 dollars. so sometimes you can literally find them for nothing not, not like not that much and their paint jobs are pretty good like i said that orange belly is pretty unique with a pink paint job like you really don't see that much and it really is a really nice uh orange like it has like this really fine glitter in it it's really hard to get it i mean i see it flashing even though it's not focused i also see your pinky nail long as hell dude the good luck uh pinky so you you playing guitar with that pinky what are you doing dog nah that yeah looks like you're growing that poppy out I'm just playing, um, but yeah, no. Nah, but like I said, it's like a sunburst orange color. I think that's what is that's the actual paint color, and yeah. it definitely works. It definitely is a pretty nice color, and like I said, it it swims really well. And I really actually, um, uh, I bought it because of the crazy bass fisher. He was the one who like I seen the first video on who was talking sure. about it. And he was pretty much using it like a bank fisherman. And since like a, like it floats, you know, you don't have to worry about getting snagged, you know. And so it's something that you don't have to worry about. And that's why I think, you know, most people should start off with is just a floating swim bait and not, you know, a slow sink or, you know, fast sink, whatever. Anything that goes on the bottom, I think they should stay away from, you know. Or if you do want to get something that gets down to the bottom, use like a crankbait or I mean a crank down like something like that you know so and you know that I've been testing it a, a good amount of bills already getting messed up but it's kind of sucks but it is what it is you know and but I have not gotten a bite on this bait which kind of sucks <laughs> people are getting you good in the comments dude that that's dirty Oh, God damn. Um, let, let me get back to JP's comment. Uh, he was asking about hooks on the Slide Summer 175. And to be honest, I mean, I know that uh, that someone already mentioned the STX hooks, that, uh, that 45 uh, with the zinc coating. I don't, I don't throw those hooks. Um, I, not really for any reason in particular. I just, I throw the ST36 for like so many different applications. Uh, and I, I even throw them on swim bait. So there are, there are some situations where maybe a wide gap or an O'Shaughnessy style hook um, is, yeah. is slightly preferred. But no, I, I throw either a size one or a one aught in that owner ST36, which is, a bit more accessible, a bit more affordable, kind of, uh, but still going to want a, a high-end treble, and I prefer owner to Gamakatsu just ever so slightly. 
Yeah, I definitely, what I, I think you should pretty much, if you're going to want like feather trebles, I think you should do them yourself. It's really like the best way to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, you can really choose on how much you want on the feather, on the actual treble. You don't have to worry about maybe buying one and it's not too, uh, the way you want it. And then also they're kind of expensive. Like I've noticed that oh, yeah. EDM ones, they're like, you get like two hooks and it's like $80. I mean like eight bucks. Like, yeah, I, I'm like, what? I thought it was like maybe like four or something at least, but you know, no, it's like four dollars a hook versus one dollar a hook yeah. if you're buying, you know, a standard pack, you know, eight hooks or whatever, you're spending seven to ten bucks at most. So, uh, it you're absolutely right, and I, I do the same thing in the off season, you know, I'll, I'll tie up some jigs, but I do a lot of feather travel tying question um, man. absolutely makes sense to, to tie your own yeah for sure because like i said i it really makes no sense and then you can pretty much save you know tons of money and or just make stuff that you don't see out there you know what i mean there's mm -hmm. sometimes a limited amount of you know type of treble uh wrapped or you know feathered trebles that are out there they're only like white or black or maybe just like reddish and sometimes right make your own with, you know, tinsel mixed with feather or marabou or, you yeah. know, make the little puff ball like they do in uh, Japan to pretty much make the bait uh, to like stunting it pretty much to where it ends up making the bait do a lot less than what it does. That's what totally. they do with the DRTs uh, when they want to put in that spy bait mode where they put those big marabou uh, hook, pretty much feathered hooks and it just pretty much lessens the bait and pretty much just makes it just like a dart. Right. And they just reel it in straight. I actually been wanting to do that. And I had a color of a DRT that was specifically made for that. And I sold it and I really, I regret doing that. But, um, but like I said, you know, if you want something that goes down and cranks down to like, you know, two, three feet, definitely get something like, you know, like this or a crank down in general and you'll probably be a lot better off and not have as much of a chance of snagging that bait and losing it like something like this you know this little guy right here will get snagged real quick uh, if you get too confident in a way that where you let it get to where it ends up getting too low and a lot of people don't put into you know uh like retrospect that pretty much as every time when you're as soon as you throw that bait out glide and say it's a slow sink and once it hits the water it's already sinking you know then as soon as you start retrieving that bait wants to pretty much start where it's at so if it say it's a foot deep already you're starting at a foot then as soon as you say you want to stop and give that bait a pause it's going to sink some more gets to about a foot and a half to two feet then you keep gliding some more you stop again it's going to get down to three feet and no, sooner or later, you're not going to realize that it's, you know, four or five feet deep. And then you right. start reeling some more and boom, you think you've got a bite and it's a piece of wood. And that's when people are like, well, how the hell did it get down there? Or how the hell did it get? You know, they don't understand that. And I didn't either. I was confused. I was like, what the hell? I was like, dude, I was just retrieving this. And then literally a couple seconds later, it snagged. And I'm like, how the hell did that happen? Until somebody explained that to me. And I was like, oh, shit. I was like, damn, I never really thought of it like that. I was like, the bait really doesn't come back up unless you're, like, pulling it back up to the surface right. or if it's floating. And um, But if it's sinking, it's never going to really be coming back up unless you're pulling it up. So, you know, that's where it kind of sucks. And you got to really put that into, you know, uh, you know, into retrospect that if you're going to be using it like that, make sure that you're just consistently winding that in and you know not really letting it fall consistently over and over and over and then snagging it so totally. no and that's something that you know it it just goes to show that you really have to pay super close attention to to what you're doing and the second that you recognize that your bait is coming in four or five feet deep when you thought it was running one and a half to two feet yeah that you know all those little things matter right that the second that that bait hits the water that you engage the reel and reel up your slack so that that time you did not account for 
where you thought you were starting to retrieve the bait right away, there's actually like a good second or longer between when it hits the water and when you catch up to the bait. Yeah. Uh, like that, first of all, and then the way that you're retrieving the bait, you yep. know, the, the position of your rod toward the bait, the speed at which you're retrieving the bait, the action that you're imparting and any pauses that you're giving it. Like you do need to be aware of that. I've, I've realized that in some situations and all of a sudden realized that like, okay, at least halfway through the middle of my retrieve, I need to lift the tip of the rod or on one of the times that I'm working the bait, yeah. when I impart some action with the rod or the reel, I'm going to actually pull it up and I'm going to make sure that time the bait is actually working its way up the water so that then I'm adjusting that depth from three or four feet back up to two feet yeah. for the rest of the retrieve. And it might not be the best looking part of the retrieve, but it's like a reset. Yeah. You don't have to burn that thing in and recast, right? Mm -hmm. like little things like that yeah. can certainly matter. Yeah. And then um, Daniel here, what he's saying, like, there's actually a good question. And um, how often do expensive custom swim baits end up just sucking? Right. Uh, and honestly, I will be straight honest with you. It's a trap, man. Like literally it's a trap. Like it, it, it's hard to almost like be like, oh, you know, I, I'm not going to get that. But then when you get into like swim baits or when you're first into it, you're going to want to try every damn thing there is. And then if, you know, something looks appealing enough to you, it'll get you and they'll grab you with it. And literally you're going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to catch a giant on this baby. And then you're like getting it and then you test it out. And then you started using it a little bit and you're like, damn, it didn't really swim like it looked like it did. And then you're like, oh man, well, maybe they just had the best one and they showed a video of it and pretty much fooled you and made you buy it. But, you know, sometimes the baits, you know, are more than what they look, you know, or seen, you know, they may look like they're amazing online or on videos or swim videos. And then when you get one, you're like, well, what the hell just happened? Why is mine not swimming like that? And sometimes I've had baits that I have, have had, like, you know, like that. And, you know, I'm not going to throw people under the bus, but, you know, there's certain bait makers that I've had where they were considered, you know, the most hype brands ever. And, you know, oh, this bait is a, you know, a unicorn or, oh, it's meant to catch you fish or blah, blah, blah. And I've bought multiple of those baits, wasted probably two, three hundred dollars on each one of those baits and not a damn fish on them. So That's is it really ass, the, dude. and is that really uh something that is it worth that? You know what I'm saying? Like is it really worth spending two, three hundred dollars a bait to just end up having it where it just works is just as good as probably your seventy or eighty dollar ABS bait? Probably not. And that's why it really is mainly a, uh, uh, you know, Instagram or Facebook like thing. It's really to get likes and, you know, to up there pretty much and just stay in trend pretty much. And that's why you see guys just jumping from baits to baits and then really selling other baits they got to support the new baits they want. <laughs> and so it's really like a on and off thing. And it's like if they don't have the newest bait or the, trendiest bait in their lineup you're you know you're not really in the game or you're not really the uh top guy i guess but you know there's some guys that i know that been fishing for a long time and swim bait fishing and they use baits that are old as shit and literally will catch tons of fish and you know it's just something that they've got confidence when and a lot of all you know the swim bait guys that are in the swim bait community, like, you know, certain people that have been around for a while, like Oliver Nye and a couple other guys, they pretty much will say that same thing that, you know, it's not really the bait that makes the, make you catch those fish. It's the angler and how they work those baits and the way that they put them in the situations where they need to be bitten. And sometimes it's also where these fish, you know, if they're going to bite it or not, you know, and you got to know when to put that bait down and when not to, you know, when to use it. And sometimes they will bite it and sometimes they don't. And you, I, I say that all the time is that you, you will know if they're going to bite a swim bait 
because sometimes I've literally had where I've literally thrown my tiny clash and five minutes later I've got a fish on and literally they're biting all that same day. And I've had where I've caught six, seven fish on a tiny clash in one day. And so it, it's possible to get numbers on them. It's just that, like I said, if they really want it or they're really looking for those type of size of a bait, they'll eat it. But if they don't, they don't and you're just going to be force feeding them and pretty much exposing them to that bait and pretty much making them get used to that damn uh pattern that you're doing and they will then sooner or later get used to that and probably stop following it and not actually attack it so and that's what mike gilbert talks about all the time is that you know if those fish are not wanting the bait or soft bait even if they're not eating that bait stop showing it to them because you will sooner or later they will pick up on that pattern just like how they pick up on crankbaits sinkers, sure. and all those other things that they pick up on and they p pick up on that and the way where it's really i think where the bait's coming from they see that something's coming by them in a certain way they realize that oh it keeps coming from that one direction and they literally end up picking that up and then they're like oh, i'm gonna leave that alone it's not really like they're almost like falling for it to where they get like this fired up sort of uh trigger where they're like oh shit let me see this what this is and then they attack it out of nowhere because you gave it that sort of random twitch or whatever it may be that they wanted to eat it and so i think it's like an on and off thing there's really no and or like there's no way to actually guarantee that you're going to catch a fish on a swim bait it's more or less that it's got to be the right scenario right situation and the right timing and sometimes it works your way and sometimes it doesn't and sometimes people get a lucky streak to where they catch fish on swim baits for weeks on end and then the next year they come and they literally are having a tough time catching fish so like i said it's very situational and it definitely depends but if you want to catch fish using them you can you know what i mean and that's if you wanted to do that but using a swim bait makes you no better than any other person using a crankbait a cinco a jig and them catching the same size fish that you're catching with a swim bait. You know what I mean? And Preach. there's guys, that, there's guys that do that. And I don't really agree with that because like I said, I originally started as a conventional fisherman and that's where I really, you know, learned most of the things I learned from to then apply to like the swim baits. You know, that's why sometimes guys have a lot of tough time when they're just going right to swim baits and then they buy a nine, eight inch, 10 inch bait. And they're like, oh, I haven't caught anything on my bait. And, I, you know, they'll say it's trash. But that's really because probably that bait is not the right size for your area. And number two, it's probably that you haven't really learned how to use it or put it in the right places. And that's really it. So once you figure those things out and realize that maybe the bait that you're using is maybe a little bit too big and you're sacrificing the actual fish that you could be catching instead but instead of you're trying to draw power which i hear so many people use that word so much time drawing power but literally uh any little a bait that's above i think four or five inches is going to draw them unless you're in dirty water and literally if you're using dirty water it really i think doesn't even matter at that point because the fish in dirty water i think are doing a totally different thing than fish in clear water when it comes to hunting fish or their you know food source uh, I think they use more of the lateral line and cloudier or dirtier water than they're using sight. So if, as long as the bait is making somewhat of a commotion or pushing water, I think you can still catch fish in dirty water with a swim bait than you can with in clear water. It's just yeah. that in clear water, that's going to be a little bit more pressured. So you might want to use a little bit more of a quieter bait, like a soft bait or something that's not, or a, a glide bait or something that has, you know, silencers on it, like this bait here has silencers built onto it and you can buy them as well on uh a loon's website it's called joint silencers but they're literally just little rubber pieces that go on the joint mm -hmm. and so when the the bait hits it's no noise yeah so all you hear is those hooks hitting and nothing else so and compared to you know something like a little tiny short cake which makes a shit ton of noise which this bait is pretty good for like i said cloudy water it actually works pretty decent in it and um or tinted water and then you have this bait which it looks like it would work and obviously you know uh 
cloudy or dirty water, but it's mainly actually a clear water bait. And it's considered more like a jerk bait. And that's what this does. It's pretty much like a tiny clash, but in a long, narrow profile and just dead twitches back and forth. So it's pretty interesting, but you can definitely do that yourself and get them from Alu's website and put them on your glide baits. It will maybe take about um, like a couple millimeters off the joint, but sure. if you want it to silence your bait and make right. it a bit different, you could definitely do that. Well, and, and I've heard of guys doing that on, uh, you know, wooden baits in particular uh, and high-end baits, like say the Roman-made mother for example right um uh, like sure you make a good point that it it affects the action because it's going to fill in some of the space of where the joint is but on the other hand it silences the bait and then it protects the wood when it's knocking so yeah. much you run the risk of it actually damaging the wood on the front portion of the bait right They're cracking yeah yeah which would be shitty if you're using a you know thousand dollar bait three hundred dollar negotiator or five hundred dollar mother or you know like yeah. it just uh, i would suck yeah and that's why i was surprised like that's one thing with this bait here the it's in a wood bait and i i wish they would have done that with this because literally I've noticed that on a lot of pictures where I've seen where guys have used ones that the joint on the edge, literally this little edge right here would just get yeah. chipped. Yeah, really exactly. Start, chunks will start coming off little, little by little, especially if that clear coat starts to wear away, it, it ends up getting, becoming pretty much done. And that's why you have to really take care of certain wood baits. And that's another thing that comes with wood baits that, you know, you have to really to keep an eye on is that, you know, you make sure you don't uh, wear down to the point where you get down to past that uh, clear coat and then start exposing the wood and then using on top of that wood. That's when it gets bad. So, but like I said, it, it does give it a different sign. And obviously if you want a, a, a loud noise, yeah, it will give it a loud noise. So... And this is also uh, the sweet coat. I mean, I, this is one I actually forgot. I didn't mention that. This guy right here, man. This little dude, the sweet killer. Mm. This man, this got bit a lot last year, and I caught a lot of fish on this. And this. Now you swapped that tail out. Yeah, yeah, the tail fell out, and so I just kind of went and pretty much made my own. Well, not made my own, but just used the DRT Tiny Clash tail, and it seemed to fit pretty good. Fits and, in kind of the same. I mean, doesn't the, the the silent killer tail have that like split straight tail? Yeah, it's it's actually a Sakamata shad tail. Ah, that they just good. that they just put on the back, and then they just made it their own in in a different way. But it's pretty much if you look up how they designed the bait, it's a Sakamata shad the back tail, and they literally just cut it and then made it into. It. So I could take a Sakamata shad and, and technically do that, but if yeah. i but i've seen like this way actually worked a little bit better and it gave almost the same sort of glide and or walk in pretty much the same way and like i said it's a, it's a great profile in size it's not too big not too small and it has the same sort of lip as a tiny clash and it it does pretty well near like wood and stuff like that and like i said it, it gets bit i don't know why but it, it got bit as soon as i used it so when when and why would you throw that? And it's got very little rattle. You know, obviously the sweet killer is very different than the silent killer, or you know the, yeah. the like like that's the silent killer is a lot more. So it's pretty much like a smaller. Yeah, that profile. I very mean, I did. I didn't even quite think about that until now. I like I see the sweet killer with that tail on it. I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. You know, you know the the silent killer right here, which is this little guy. This. It's just the slide. It's a lipped slide swimmer, but. It's a little bit, a little bit bigger. But what they did was they took the 145 size bo uh, body, 
and they of the slide swimmer and they yeah. just pretty much uh made it a little bit bi uh bigger and then to obviously took the the lip the face a little bit and changed it but it's really the sl slide swimmer 145 with just the, this v tail sort of configuration and a different joint so it, it same body shape it, it looks skinny dude yeah it, it's pretty it's pretty skinny it's not too thick but it's pretty interesting it's not yeah, but, the, but that tail section is also different it doesn't have the body condom on it right no 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 it's does, all abs pretty much does the silent killer yeah the silent killer is just abs so there's no soft skin or anything like the actual you know silent killer does so the silent killer is essentially just a lipped slide swimmer but the sweet killer is a totally different yeah, it's totally different. section, totally different construction, just similar body shape. Yeah. Interesting. Yep. And then they're also making a 210 that's coming out soon. That's the one I'm really looking for. That that one's going to be sick. But the uh, – and then also there's another bait that I don't hear many guys talk about, and it's kind of an old bait. But this right here is a uh, Depths High Sider Minnow. High, it's called High Sider Junior Minnow, and this is actually made out of the same material as the old OG uh, Depth Slide Swimmer, which is that composite foam material. Yeah. And so it, it's the same sort of thing, and it's also foiled. And uh, but it's pretty much it's got this very small lip, and you would think it only would be like a weight bait, but it's not. It goes down to like three feet. It's weird, and it's pretty interesting how deep it goes for how small of a lip it has but I think it's the way it's designed it has like this little sort of like uh flat bottom so it cuts the water yeah. better and there was a guy that actually uh it's called DS swim baits and I was telling him about it because he was designing a deep diving swim bait and he had the lip the other way and he had it sort of like this like grind it down but the other way upwards and i was like you might want to switch that upside down and i was like because i've seen a lot of jdm guys doing that and he was like oh why and i was like i think it puts less drag on the water and allows the bait to get deeper and he was like ah oh, i'll see about that he's like i'll test that out and then he did end up testing it out and he ended up making the bait that way where he put the actual lip downwards with the that angle and i asked him you know what why did uh, he go with that and he's like it did end up putting a less drag on the on the rod and then got deeper so i was like interesting so i was like that that might be why they're doing that but like i said it's made of that composite material and uh you kind of can see it there but it's got a unique sound to it and it's very minnow like like it literally is the name in it and it literally looks like a minnow swimming and it's very realistic wise and that tail with that uh Feather treble, it literally has like a very unique uh, sort of like tail wobble to it. It actually looks like a fin moving. And but the one thing is, is that the reason why they discontinued it was because it was the hook placement wasn't the best. And sure, so, yeah, you get a lot of fish hitting it and then missing. Yeah, so I was seeing that too, and I noticed that. And then now they brought it back. And they made a new one, and it's supposed to come out, I think, next year or the end of this year. And the new one looks amazing. Like, it looks really nice. It looks totally different, actually. And it's made out of an ABS plastic, not a foam. And um, and it actually swims really, really well. And I think it comes with three hooks, so instead of having two. So it's a lot better. And it has I was going to say, if, if that bait only has two hooks, that, that front hook hanger needs to be about an inch back right before yeah, that. Yeah. I think it should have been like right here. Yeah, maybe even in that second joint. Yeah. Yeah, and I, like I said, I think it also it could probably even uh, put bigger hooks on it, longer shank hooks to yeah. help with that. But and then I'm but I was thinking about it, like if the fish came up from right here and grabbed it when you hook, it's gonna get them right that, like that. Yeah, you would think, but, but if the, the way thing is, we tend to be a little slower than we think on on yeah. setting the hook. You know, usually a fish that T-bones it is not holding on to it that long, right? It's a boom off it. Like and by the time it. we feel 
and go to set, he's he's already turned around. Yeah, like that's true. There's no way we're that responsive when we feel that and then set that he's still holding on to that bait. Like yeah. usually, the reason we get them is because they hook themselves by grabbing onto it and then trying to spit it out, and they're fiddling with it when we set. Yeah, that's true. Well, that's why you know that top tracer sort of like, you know, look on it kind of helps. And that's why yeah. I kind of like that. And also have traces on certain of my baits because you can kind of see when the fish do hit right away in a way where once they hit, you kind of look at the tracer. You're not looking at the bait really. You're just looking at that tracer and it, you're usually seeing it and it's, you know, level on with the bait, the way it's swimming. And then all of a sudden you'll see the bait go like that. And as soon as you see that tracer move out of position, that's when you just set the hook. And I've noticed that. And also pretty much when I've watched a lot of JDM fishermen that use the tracers on their baits, that's what they're doing. They're literally looking at that tracer specifically so they can see when that fish, as soon as they bite, they can hit that and get that instant you know, hook set instead of being a little bit late and then waiting on the response from the rod. Yeah. So they're that's visually smart. seeing it versus them waiting on the rod so it does help a bit i think get a little bit quicker of a response to you know set the hook well dang it dude now it's like after our conversation i feel like i need tracers i need board weights maybe even uh you know some floats i'd like probably not as much uh of those you know floating uh, stickers but definitely board weights um and tracers for sure for swim bait fishing yeah tracers are man, like i said I, I have tons of them and they work i have like six seven different colors yeah i have like all these different colors hold on i got orange chartreuse silver and then i got glow in the dark black so like literally all those nice and, and the one is actually glow in the dark like this one right here the glow in the dark one for night fishing so you can literally i'll charge them up for a second you'll end up seeing them like charge so uv light does the trick Gets yeah you, on. you just go back and forth a little bit i mean i can see it already dude and if i go real real slow now it's off camera but yeah those are glowing yeah and then if i like why i watch i'll turn the damn light off for a second you'll see they're actually pretty good they're like they last a pretty long time too like i had where i fished one of them and literally it lasted about like six seven minutes on just one charge so literally like yeah those are pretty bright and you just had them on there for 30 seconds. Yep. And that right there, man, like I said, you can see them from pretty far away. I believe it. Yeah. And and like I said, they definitely help for night fishing and specifically. And when it's real dark out, you definitely can see them from far away and it helps. Because sometimes where I've had, you know, bites on fish or rats where I didn't even feel it until... I, they were like almost coming off and then when i set the hook like you said they just completely weren't there so yeah. when you get those night traces man you literally see that bait and go to the side and boom you just set the hook and usually you'll get them so smart 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 yeah i didn't think about that you know i tend to do a lot better fishing rats like around the full moon because i've got slightly better visibility and i find that when i can see the bait like my, I'm so much more responsive than just mm -hmm. listening to the bait coming back, and it's got to be like perfect, no wind for me to hear that knock, 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 yeah. knock, 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 sploosh, or something, you know, of that knocking kind of disappearing because the bait got sucked under, yeah. whatever it is. Like it's so much better when I can see the wake and see the bait, and that you just know. So if you can actually see the top of the bait, that'd be sweet. Yeah, like I said, it definitely helps. And that's why I think a lot of baits that do have the tracers, that's why that 
depth sweet killer i like it a lot because it pretty much has like a tracer built into the paint job and the couple actually different swim baits have that and uh that's why i say the back tracer and that helps a lot because you can see it and i've noticed that too is that when you want your tracers the back really is the most important part because when the bait is the way it's angled it will literally have the back upwards further sure. so you can kind of see it further from away like it's almost like in an angle and so it definitely helps when it's in the back when it's in the front you barely see the one that's in the front usually you see the one that's on the tail so usually the best way to do that is get like the thickest one you can find and put it on the tail and probably put a little tiny one on the front just on the far back of that front half like sort of like this where this one here this is a bigger that's not good oh damn that's like 10 pounds of damn baits that just fell yeah <laughs> sounded like it <laughs> And so, like, uh, right here on this bait here, uh, the one on the back is far, far back. And then this one is on the back as well. Like, it's not on the front up in here. Because I've seen some guys where they'll have them up here. And I've done that same thing. And it, you really can't see it. Yeah. So, when it's further back and that bait is, like, kind of, like, in that angle, you can kind of see it a lot better in the water. So, it definitely helps. And this bait here is so damn clear that you can't even see the damn hook rash stuff on there. That has a hook rash car on it. And you can't even see it. That's cool. Right there on the corner on the back, you can kind of see it. But it's literally really pretty, like, impossible to see. So, so what, that's, that's just the standard size K9? Yeah, that's the K9, just the regular one. How much does that bait weigh? Uh, this one is four ounces. Okay. Yeah, it's four. The tiny clash, I think, is like uh, two ounces or close to two ounces. But definitely, uh, definitely helps. And then you get certain ones that, uh, with the tracer wise, you have the reflective one and also uh, regular, uh, like matte color and also just bright colors as well. So you can get ones that have like that, you know, like when you're running the those three M material. It's like the 3M reflective material that it pretty much is on the sticker. So every time it sh the sun pretty much gets in an angle where the sun is, you get this shine on top and you can kind of see a little bit more visibly. And yeah. on low light, sort of, it helps on lower light. I wonder how much fish can see that, you know, because I was thinking about that a few minutes ago. Like, yeah, I, I doubt most of the time a fish is going to see the tracer since it's on top of the bait, right? Yeah. So even if you've got like a you know, bright colored one, they're seeing the bait from below or exactly. maybe from the side. They're not seeing the tracer on top. But if you've got a reflective one and it's actually flashing light, sure, it's mostly flashing light up or out of the water as opposed to down. But I wonder, you know, if all of a sudden the light is just like refracting in, yeah. in ways that are it's like unnatural – are fish seeing that? Is is it appealing? Yeah. Is it not? Right? That's true. You know, I, I do wonder about that kind of thing sometimes. And then if you think about it, you know, these board weights, they have these holographic film on it. And yeah. that's the bottom. And I think that actually helps them strike better. And uh, right. I don't know why, but for some reason, I've noticed that when I put these holographic strips on my swim baits, a lot of the time they get bit pretty well and i think it just causes like a reaction sort of strike with that sort of like flare of shine coming from the bottom sure and they kind of see that and they just kind of get a little bit more interested in it and just want to like attack it just for no reason yeah so. no that makes sense so john makes a good point yeah maybe we are you know maybe it's uh time to call it a night um I didn't realize how late it was. We've been on for almost three hours. Um, yeah, yeah. My back's kind of hurting me too, by the way. All right. <laughs> yeah, mine is a little bit too. Yeah. I mean, cool. um, 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 all right, guys. Um, thank you guys. guys wise, man. Appreciate yeah. you uh, yeah. having me on. Thank you to everybody who's been in here watching this. Yeah, yeah. And uh, thanks, guys, for, you know, watching and 
staying on for so long. I really help. I really appreciate you guys doing that. And uh, also keep in, uh, engaged in the the comments. That was a pretty good uh, amount of questions and for sure. a lot of people engaging in the chat. So I like that. And uh, I really appreciate that. And if you guys can leave a like as well, uh, that really, really appreciate that. And uh, thanks, you guys, for uh, coming on and watching. Absolutely. I'll see you Dude, guys. Dan, John, Abe, Daniel, have a great night, guys. See you guys.